you have lower interest rates, which the Fed is going to deliver. The question is how much. We're looking for a 25 basis point rate cut, but for them to really signal they're going to do a sequence of cuts here. A lot of the people on the street that have 25 basis point rate cut calls They'd have no problem with the Fed going 50 either. There's a really good chance that they move 50 simply to front load the process. They do need to be cautious of being too dovish because we're coming off some pretty significant speculation, but it's still not relieved from the market yet. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Abramowitz and Anne-Marie Hordern. It is the most important day of the year. It's Bramo's birthday. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Happy birthday, Bramo. Thank you. Well, you know, I hear there's a meeting just for my birthday. This is we're doing just that. Wait. Chairman Powell organized it. We're bringing cakes in a little bit later. That's all we're going to say. All right. From New York City this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Let's get your trading day started on this Fed decision day. Coming into it very close to all time highs on the S&P 500 and just about holding on to a seven day winning streak. Equity futures firmer by a tenth of one percent on the S&P. Lisa on the Nasdaq up by two. A key question about whether we continue with the rotation trade, whether we continue with this feeling that the Fed can cut rates significantly and that can be good for risk assets very much on the table today. Ray Dalio says the right thing is 25. Jeff Gunlock says it's 50. We're already in recession. Jamie Dimon says, everyone calm down. It's going to be OK. And that's going to be what we're going to be talking about for the rest of the day. This is a low conviction meeting. We haven't seen one like this for a long, long time. Given we don't have much conviction, why would the Fed? And this is what Ian Lincoln of BMO's got to say. If the Fed isn't certain as to the size of the first cut, it is very unlikely to have confidence in the magnitude and pace of the full campaign. Are we expecting too much from this Federal Reserve this afternoon? You mean clarity? Yeah, I think maybe we're not going to get the same kind of clarity as people previously had been hoping for and dreaming of. But you do get a better sense uh, over the balance of risks. Maybe you even get a dissent, maybe even from a potential governor. For the first time in about 20 years, we're looking at a Fed that has had consensus for so many years that now suddenly that could be used as a tool to potentially give even more uncertainty around the edges that we can dissect for the next couple of months. So let's get to the Canada. Two p.m. Eastern time, you'll get a Fed decision. 30 minutes after that, after we've poured through the statement and the forecast, we'll get a news conference with Chairman Powell. And then after this one, you've got to wait until November 7th, two days after the general election in this country. And things could be very different by the time we get to November. On the campaign trail, it's been promise after promise. And marie Trump will bring back a tax break for the people of New York. Harris will cap childcare costs. Spend, spend, spend. As I've been saying, this is the Oprah Winfrey election, especially when it comes to taxes. Everyone seems to be getting a cut. The latest coming from Trump, though, on SALT, is a U-turn from his own legislation that he's out on the trail every single day touting the Trump-era tax cuts, where they capped SALT at $10,000. Now, you could think this is a pure play, less so for Trump at the top of the ticket, but down ballot. He's going to be speaking tonight on Long Island in New York for a very swing district. And the issue there is Republican holds it now. They flipped it after decades. Uh, this is Republican Desposito. And I think Trump is trying to help shore up some of these House votes. But again, how is he going to pay for it? That's the objective. Let's talk about the cost. This comes from the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. Check out this number. We estimate this would increase the cost of extending the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act by 1.2 trillion US dollars over the next decade. And it's a point that you made yesterday that I thought was a really important one, which is as much as people say divided Congress that can't get through, is that really the case when you have enough tax cuts that potentially are bipartisan, where you potentially are catering to the other side that could potentially pass said tax cuts? It all just raises the prospect of more spending, less revenue without necessarily an offset that really hasn't been recognized in the debt markets, which, again, going back to that November 7th meeting, what do you do, Fed? I mean, how do you deal with this? And then why not just front load it now and then say, we'll deal with it then and just, you know, kick it over to then? That's why I think what Powell says today is almost more important. If there's 50 50, does he come out and say we are trying to get ahead of the curve? Because this is going to be used by Republicans saying that they're only cutting 50 because what do they know that we don't know? But it's going to be used as Democrats as, well, clearly inflation is no longer a concern. And now, this is what Lael Brainerd said this week at the Council on Foreign Relations, we need to make sure that we secure the labor market gains. There's a lot to work through this morning. If you're just tuning in, good morning. Equity futures right now on the S&P 500 firmer by a tenth of 1% in the bond market yields up by a base point or two, the 10-year 366.24, euro dollar 
Stronger euro. Weaker dollar, Lisa, here. 111.38. If you take a look at the last Fed meeting, you have a dollar right now on the DXY index that is about 3% weaker. This is basically across the board, this baked-in bet that the Fed is going to cut, not by 50 or 25 basis points. Maybe it's not earth-shattering, but we care. And there's a question going forward of whether they're still going to cut by more than 200 basis points by the end of next year. And that, I think, we might get some signal about today. It's an interesting setup, isn't it? Equities, bonds, foreign exchange, stocks near all-time highs. Bond yields near the lows of the year. The dollar near the weakest level of the year. It's an interesting setup. Just how stretched are we going into this one? How offsides could traders be if the Fed goes by 25 basis points and says, you know what? Baby Jamie Dimon had a point. Everyone calm down. It's going to be OK. We're moving. It doesn't matter exactly the pace. We're going to get it down. Did he give us a weather forecast yesterday? Storms, hurricanes, something worse? The clouds, the clouds. Are, are gathering okay. over the geopolitical framework. That's what it feels like. More on the geopolitics later. Stunning, stunning scenes out of Lebanon yesterday, like something out of an action movie. We'll catch up with Jumana a little bit later this hour at 6.30 Eastern time. Coming up this hour, we'll also catch up with Julian Emanuel of Evercore with stocks near record highs ahead of the Fed. We'll speak to Bloomberg's Kelly Lines with more tax promises on the campaign trail and Torsten's lock of Apollo on why monetary policy doesn't seem very restrictive to him. We begin with our top story, Decision Day for the Federal Reserve, with investors divided on the central bank and whether they'll cut rates by 25 or 50 basis points. Julian Emanuel of Evercore is still bullish. This is what he's got to say. The unique intersection of monetary and political volatility in late 24 reinforces the refrain we've heard from many clients. This is the most difficult bull market we've ever seen, but by no means derails the path to 6,000 at year end. Julian's with us around the table. Julian, good morning. Good morning. Are we overstating the importance of the first move of the Federal Reserve? No, not this time, because really, when you think about it, the backdrop is probably as unique as we could have ever imagined. And I think uh, a lot of people are surprised that that is the context with stocks at all time highs. Uh, but the fact is, is that we've seen the economy start to weaken around the edges. Um, it's normal that the economy should slow. That's what we've wanted uh, all along. But confidence is a very fragile thing, uh, particularly when the economy is starting to slow and you're getting signals from the labor market. Um, and so in that respect, really, the Fed's job is to make sure that it sends a message, whatever it does today, and we do think they do 50 today, uh, that it's on the case if there is a deterioration in the data in and around election and an election that is going to be more divisive than you know we can imagine at this point. Evercore's already sent a message in the last week. Ed Hyman, Evercore throwing in the towel on a hard landing call, gave a whole host of reasons for that. As you sit here this morning, could you share a few of them? Why a little bit more constructive now? Well, it, 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 it's look, the, the, the labor market data is, again, slowing, but by no means, you know, by all rights, you're still under Nehru uh, in, in terms of, of where the labor market is. Uh, the weekly high frequency data, the confidence has been subdued, but it hasn't really mattered because, and again, as we saw this, is the consumer continues to spend. You know, there's a concern that the savings rate has dropped as low as it is. And I think that's something we'll be watching very carefully. Uh, but so far, it does appear as if the deceleration is only that a deceleration and not a downturn. How much does this hinge going back to the first point on just what the Fed does and how much they cut this year and signal for next year? Well, I. I I think there's been a lot of Sturm und Drang around the concept of data dependency. But when you're at a turning point like this, it is important to at least acknowledge the importance of data dependency. And I go back to my uh, idea that confidence, particularly around the election, could be very fragile. And so from that perspective, the Fed needs to indicate that even with 50 we are still in reasonably restrictive territory and we'll see and we'll figure out what we have to do as we go along. But that, yes, this is the beginning of a cycle and not a, you know, one off. Some people wonder how could we get to 6,000, especially by the end of this year, if we've already seen uh, such high elevation, uh, high valuations in the tech sector after we've seen the rally already in the uh, small caps as well as some other sectors that have been challenged. And you say, 
watch the buybacks. It's all about the buybacks. If they can buy back their shares cheaply, it doesn't matter. How much is that really underpinning this whole call that if you get lower rates, that is going to just de facto support stock valuations in a new kind of way? Well, it, it's and again, when we think of the entirety of this year, it is proper. It is right to be a little bit uh, uncomfortable about where valuations are. That's part of this wall of worry that has supported higher prices. But when we step back, the uniqueness of the earnings cycle right now is something that really has supported and we think continues to support markets. We could think back to six months ago. Everyone was absolutely, you know, obsessed by the fact that the other 493 stocks in the S&P 500 weren't growing their earnings. We find out in the second quarter that those 493 are back to five and a half percent earnings growth. And the picture looks as good, if not better, uh, over the balance of the year and into 2025. And that to us along with the fact that the Fed is going to be supportive, uh, is, in our mind, sufficient to get to 6,000. Julian, you keep mentioning this political uncertainty. In 2020, the election was on November 3rd. November 7th is when networks started coming out and saying who actually won. The Fed might be going into their next meeting not knowing who's president of the United States. How does that affect their decision? Uh, it, it most certainly you know, does affect... The first thing they'll want to do is see, again, how the data evolves between now and then, but also see how the asset markets evolve. And, and I think, you know, this is part of the narrative of really our generation to disentangle stocks from the economy. People say they want to do it. You can't do it. The wealth effect is a real concept. Uh, and so they're going to really have to monitor the situation particularly with regard to the, uh, the ability of the election to be contested. Um, and I think, uh, you know, our analysis is probably less like 2020 in terms of the risk and maybe more like year 2000, where you didn't know who the president was for an entire month afterwards. So let's stay on that. What did the Fed do in 2000 that maybe they should look back and consider this year? Well, the economy was slowing in, in 2000. We had very high valuations, uh, as we do now. Um, so there are a lot of similarities. And, and the Fed just kind of sat on its hands and didn't cut rates until January of 01, when, frankly, the mood had soured, financial markets had soured, and it was already too late. The recession of 01 w was in front of us. And we think that Powell and the Fed understands that history and is not going to allow that to repeat. Why do we have so much confidence the Fed will get in front of some of these challenges when we really don't know whether they'll go 25 or 50 at this meeting? A again, because if you think about it in, in terms of where the Fed is and their legacy, and they've been through an awful lot, and, and I think you, know, you can talk about the Fed in various ways, but the most effective thing they've done is fight problems. You know, the, the pandemic response was incredible. In fact, the, the unanticipated response to inflation. I mean, let's get serious. 525 basis points worth of tightening, and we haven't had a recession, and the yield curve has been in, inverted Surprised until recently. And now, of course, we're all freaked out that the yield curve is uninverted. And I would say, when you think about what the politicians are planning to spend next year, I you kind of know why. Um, but it's been a remarkable time. Before you go, just a quick question. Short, super, super short time horizon. If they don't validate market pricing today, is this market in trouble? Yeah. What kind but, of downside are you thinking about? Uh, you know, you could get sort of in a multi-day time frame, three to, three to four percent. Uh, We'd buy that. The, the, the interesting statistic that we find very relevant is in, in presidential election years where you were up double digits on Labor Day like you are this year, six out of six times you have finished higher on December 31st than where you were at Labor Day. 
that's part of our bullish thesis as Julian, well. Julian, thank you. We appreciate it, as always, sir. Thank, thank you very you. much. Julian Emmanuel of Evercore, kicking off our Fed Day coverage with equity futures just about positive on the S&P by a tenth of 1%. With an update on stories elsewhere with your Bloomberg Brief, it's Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. A legal victory for Google. It won a court fight over the EU with a $1.7 billion fine for violating competition rules. Back in 2019, the European Commission had concluded that Google illegally prevented rivals from placing ads on third party websites. Judges at the EU's top court, though, said that regulators made a mistake in that probe. Just last week, however, the court had ruled against Google's attempt to avoid a nearly $2.7 billion antitrust penalty for favoring its own product results on search. Tupperware has filed for bankruptcy. The publicly traded kitchenware company has struggled with declining sales and growing competition for years. It's listing assets up to $1 billion and liabilities up to $10 billion. Tupperware had dominated the food world of storage for decades, but began warning in 2020 there were doubts it would be able to stay in business. Steve Cohen has stopped trading for Point72. The billionaire hedge fund founder will remain as Point72's co-chief investment officer, but he's no longer investing client capital. The firm says the 68-year-old will instead focus on driving the firm's growth and mentoring and developing talent. Cohen, who also owns the New York Mets baseball team, has been one of the dominant forces in the industry for more than three decades. And that's your brief, John. Danny, thank you. Thanks for the update. More updates from Danny in about 30 minutes' time. Up next on the program, more big promises on the campaign trail. I want people to pay fair taxes and all of that, but she's going to be raising your taxes to 50, 60, 70 percent, and it's not sustainable. My plan is that no family, no working family, should pay more than 7 percent of their income in child care. The latest promises up next from New York City. Good morning. Just about squeezing out a seventh day of gains on the S&P 500. Just about in yesterday's session this morning, adding a little bit more weight to the rally, up another tenth of 1%. In the bond market, yields higher by a single basis point, the 10-year, 365.87. Under surveillance this morning, more big promises on the campaign trail. Those jobs that we created, and I, I want people to pay fair taxes and all of that, but she's gonna be raising your taxes to 50, 60, 70%. And it's not sustainable. My plan is that no family, no working family, should pay more than 7% of their income in child care. Allowing people to pursue their dreams in terms of how they want to work, where they want to work, benefits us all. It strengthens the entire economy. So here's the latest. Vice President Kamala Harris and former President Donald Trump unveiling more economic plans in a final push before November. Trump vowing to bring back the state and local tax deduction for New Yorkers, while Harris is pledging to cap child care costs. Bloomberg's Caddy Lines joins us now in Washington, D.C. Kaylee, these campaign rallies are getting more and more expensive by the week, aren't they? Well, yeah, it's a new thing pretty much every time one of them speaks, John. For Donald Trump, of course, as you mentioned, he posted on True Social ahead of a rally in Long Island that will take place later today that he's going to bring back salt. A cap, of course, that he put into place in the first place when he signed his 2017 tax package that did cap the state and local tax deduction at $10,000. Now, apparently, that's uh, going to be a reversal from him. Of course, he needs Congress to support that. But it really is a move that could be aimed more at securing or keeping the majority in the House of Representatives specifically as some of those vulnerable Republicans are in swing districts in high tax states like California and New York. Think Nick Lodota or Anthony Despacito uh, in Long Island, for example. So those are the kind of uh, members who have been advocating for a lift to the salt cap and may be helped by this kind of policy. But it's not just that. It's, of course, also no tax on tips, no tax on overtime hours, no tax on Social Security, a lower corporate tax rate if you make products in the U.S. If you tally all the all of this up, according to the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget, it's about $1.2 trillion over the next 10 years if the salt cap goes away, in addition to what could be more than $10 trillion if all of the tax promises he's made, including the permanence of the 2017 tax cuts, actually come to fruition. That's more than all of the non-defense discretionary spending that's projected in this country over the next 10 years. So the pay-fors become the question here. He, of course, Donald Trump, argues that in part it will be growth that is uh, stimulated by these tax cuts that will help 
help offset. And then, of course, his tar- tariff plans he thinks will raise more revenue for the United States. Of course, most economists will tell you the math just simply doesn't work fully on that. Kaylee, you mentioned Anthony Desposito. This is the district, a congressman from the district Trump will be speaking in this evening. He's welcomed this proposal on his Twitter. But a lot of other Republicans in Congress, as you know, actually want to penalize blue states like New York, like California. So Trump is coming out and saying this. But could he get the entire Republican Party behind lifting the salt cap? It will probably be easier among House Republicans, many of whom find themselves in districts that Biden won in 2020. And those are the voices you could add Mike Lawler to that, for example, as well, that have been advocating for a higher uh, salt cap. In the Senate is where it gets a little trickier. Of course, most Senate Republicans don't like the idea of giving gifts to blue states uh, in terms of being able to have higher tax deductions for people who live there. But even Senate leadership or those who would like to become the next Senate majority leader, they hope, like Senator John Thunes, expressed some openness to the idea if it's something that Donald Trump is advocating for, keeping in mind here that by and large, what Donald Trump says he supports is something that most Republicans on Capitol Hill to this point have gone along with. So it will be a question of whether or not Republicans do have the majorities in the House and Senate. That's going to be required for either candidate uh, to get their tax policy through, to have control of both chambers. That goes as well for Kamala Harris, who, of course, is making these promises on a child care uh, cap, essentially at 7% of income. That's something that was part of President Biden's Build Back Better agenda. They've already done that to a certain extent through grants to low-income families. But now she's, of course, promising that in other subsidies more widely. If you just sort of zoom out for a minute, Kaylee, given the fact that there is basically a promise every day that they speak and it's sort of hard, you sort of start running out of promises that you can't even possibly make, there will be overlap on some of these promises, Mm -hmm. is there a greater chance that regardless of who gets into office, they could have policies they could get through that might be discounted in just sort of this gridlock uh, Washington, D.C. that some people talk about? In other words, is there more policy implication than some people give credence to even with a mixed government? It's an excellent point, Lisa, because there is kind of this Venn diagram here of Donald Trump and Kamala Harris's proposed policies and where they overlap in terms of both being populist. We've, of course, seen them both adopt, for example, this policy that there shouldn't be tax on tipped income for service workers, hotel workers, restaurant workers, that kind of thing. Both J.D. Vance, the Republican vice presidential nominee, and Kamala Harris have talked about raising the child tax credit uh, to higher than it is now. So those are some areas where there does seem to be support from both tickets which would make it an assumption that no matter who actually assumes the Oval Office, policies in that regard could indeed uh, be put forward no matter what. Ar- arguably, the same could be said for some protectionism when it comes to tariffs, as this administration that Kamala Harris has been part of has kept intact uh, the Donald Trump uh, era tariffs on China, for that matter. Arguably, they won't be as high as what Donald Trump is proposing. Certainly, Kamala Harris hasn't suggested that, but you still could see some overlap in a lot of these policies. Kaylee, just before you go, what's the buzz like around the Federal Reserve in Congress at the moment? We've seen the letters coming from the Democratic senators asking for a 75 basis point production reduction. Do you think the drafts are ready to go to be published by the Republicans a little bit later on this afternoon? They very well may be, John, though we have seen consistent messaging around the Federal Reserve from Democrats for some time now. Elizabeth Warren has co-authored a letter like that for every meeting since January. She's been pushing for a cut, but you have seen some change in the Republican rhetoric as we have seen softening in the data. I spoke with members of both the Senate Banking and House Financial Services Committee yesterday, Bill Haggerty and Congressman Brian Stile, who both said, look, the Fed needs to follow the data. This should not be political, which is a bit of a change of tone from what we'd heard from Republicans on Capitol Hill as we anticipated potentially a Fed cut before the election, arguing that that could be seen as political. Now, even allies of Donald Trump, including Senators Josh Hawley and John Kennedy, are saying the Fed does need to cut rates because the economic data is suggesting so, and they are becoming a little bit more worried about the health of the consumer and the economy. Kelly Lyons, thank you. Dan in Washington, D.C., on the latest. You've got to imagine we see some letters, some posts a little bit later. There's going to be a truth post This afternoon, I imagine, when's the Fed cuts? Because Donald Trump has already said in an article in Business Week to our colleagues that the Fed should not be cutting before an election. He views it as political. And he's going to use this, based on some conversations I've had, I imagine the tone is going to be the Fed is cutting. Why? What do they know that we don't know? Are we heading towards a recession? That, I imagine, is going to be the Trump camp line following this Fed decision. Stay tuned for the political fallout. 
immediately after that decision, a little bit later this afternoon. Equity futures right now on the S&P, positive by a tenth of 1%. Up next on this program, stunning scenes yesterday out of the Middle East and a crude market hardly blinked. More on that conversation up next. Seven-day winning streak on the S&P 500, very close to all-time highs. We printed one yesterday, going into Fed decision day. Equity futures right now, positive by a tenth of 1% on the S&P 500. I noticed this yesterday, Lisa. Stood out for me, at least. At the close yesterday on the S&P 500, we closed exactly where we closed. The same day Chairman Powell delivered his speech in Jackson Hole at 5634 on the S&P 500. This has been a choppy road to nowhere. It has been a choppy road to nowhere on the headline level. Under the surface, there's actually been a pretty dramatic move. And this is what I actually find interesting, because you're right, on the headline uh, number, we're exactly just basically treading water under the hood. Since then, you have seen an absolute uh, shattering outperformance of small caps of equal weight versus the large caps versus some of the other uh, sort of technological names. And this raises the question, can it be sustained given what the Fed could or could not deliver today? Speaking to that move beneath the surface, equities on the S&P 500 market cap weighted might not have done much since the end of August. If you look at the front end of the yield curve, we've had a move of about 30 odd basis points on a two year lower. So we come into this decision near the lows of the year for 2024 on a two year maturity, a 10 year, a 30 year as well. Yields a little bit higher by basis point up on twos, up on tens, up on thirties by almost two. This whole yield curve just shifting higher in yesterday's session, the bond market cheapening just a little bit after a big, big run over the past few months. A lot of it was just people trying to hedge their bets because they have really put their bets uh, heavily into this rate cutting story. Just to give you perspective, the last Fed meeting, uh, 10 year yields are actually, I wanted to give you the two year yield. The two year yields were about 4.3% versus 3.6% now, just to give you a sense of the scope of that move over the course of fewer than two months. Uh, there is this question about how burned people could be if the Fed doesn't deliver not only 50 basis points, but guidance that really leans into the idea of 200 basis points of cuts at least by the end of next year. This market stretched across equities and bonds in the FX market as well, looking for some validation from a Federal Reserve a little bit later on this afternoon that might not be able to give it. Let's turn to foreign exchange. Dollar yen into yesterday on a five day dive, stronger Japanese yen. We snapped that streak with the best day for the US dollar against the yen since the middle of August. We settled down, Lisa, at 141.56 going into this one. Again, there's this nervousness. And with this particular market, really interesting to see the flip that you've seen in sentiment and in positioning when it comes to Japanese yen longs now, betting that that strength will be sustained after a potential hike uh, by the Bank of Japan, not necessarily this Friday, but the following meeting. But there is this question about whether we can see this divergence accelerate or whether we've already overpriced priced it, priced everything in, and hopes and dreams are going to be a little bit dampened. Dollar yen, negative by six tenths of one percent. Under Savannah this morning, some top stories for you. JP Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon saying the Fed's decision today is not going to be earth shattering, adding that whether the Fed cuts rates by 25 or 50 is a minor thing because underneath there's a real economy and apparently some real risk beyond this. He listed China once again as a big issue on his radar. China, Ukraine and the Middle East. He says he's way more concerned what's going on in the geopolitical sphere, saying it dwarfs anyone I've had since I've been working. So clearly he's uh, nervous about these geopolitics when it comes to the interest rate decision. He says people overly focus on are we going to have a soft landing, a hard landing? Honestly, most of us have been through all that stuff. It doesn't matter as much. I think it matters, though. Come on. It matters if you want to know the trajectory of this economy, as well as it matters to people who also maybe are trying to get on the housing market and want to see the Fed make moves. I'm sympathetic to the idea of listening to the conversation every single day about 25 or 50 and saying, really, do we have to hear this conversation again? We've talked about, do we have to have this conversation again? I feel the same way on that front, sure. It's absolutely tedious after a while. There is a larger question here about why the market is not caring more about some of the geopolitical uh, issues here and the fact that we've seen a number of companies, I'm thinking of U.S. companies, that are still expanding in China in some of these areas at a time where this still is very much a concern. So I would just raise this prospect of why have we not seen more in terms of a response from the corporations, from markets to some of these geopolitical events, because it's a decent point. This is something very much that's an overhang. What I will say is that Jamie Dimon, who also took a dig at Financial News Network, saying there's one here, keep yapping on TV about it. 
When you come to Bloomberg, you'll we see. talk about both <laughs> the Fed and geopolitical concerns. Agreed. Well said. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Let's turn to this one. People familiar with the matter telling Bloomberg a U.S. security panel is granting Nippon Steel permission to refile its plans to purchase U.S. Steel for $14 billion. The extension keeping the proposed takeover alive and likely, and this is the important point, likely pushing a decision past the election. So the clock gets restarted. Basically, they have 90 days now, which means we're not going to get a decision most likely ahead of the election. So that's the politics of it, given the fact that Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, Donald Trump all said that they want to block this deal and that U.S. steel should remain in the control of American hands. That's the politics, Pennsylvania. But actually, when you look at what's going on at CFIUS, the reporting is that the agencies don't agree. DOD and the State Department do not agree on the CFIUS panel on whether or not this is a national security concern. And until there's consensus, you're likely not going to see CFIUS want to put that on Joe Biden's desk. We'll pick up on this story later. I just want to pause and talk about the biggest story of the last 24 hours. Just pause. Imagine you received this movie script. Imagine you saw this movie at the theatre. I don't think you'd believe it. I think you'd think this was a stretch. What took place in Lebanon in the last 24 hours? Thousands of pages in Lebanon exploding yesterday, simultaneously, all at the same time, killing several people and leaving almost 3,000 wounded across the country, including hundreds of members of the Hezbollah militant group. Hezbollah accusing Israel of orchestrating the attack. Israel declining to comment. Let's head over to the region and catch up with Jamana Basechi now, joining us now from Dubai. Jamana, walk me through this. This looked like an action movie out of Hollywood. It was not. It was real life. What do we know happened? That's it. Uh, a feeling of shock, disbelief, fear is prevailing right now in Lebanon. So what we do know is that 3.30 p.m. local time yesterday, these pages all exploded simultaneously. The Lebanon health minister just put out, put out a statement now saying 2,800 people were injured, 12 people were killed, including two children, and many of them are in serious condition. There are about 200 to 300 uh, serious cases. Uh, interestingly enough, the Iranian ambassador was also harmed in this attack, uh, and both both Hezbollah and the Lebanese government were very quick to blame Israel, uh, with the Lebanese Prime Minister Najib Mi'ati saying that this is an attack on Lebanon's sovereignty. Israel themselves have declined to comment. Uh, they haven't said anything about the incident. But what this constitutes is uh, a, an embarrassing security breach for Hezbollah. It is the biggest security breach ever. And lots of people were saying, what, what were these operatives doing, walking around with pagers anyway? And you have to rewind back to a speech that Hassan Nasrallah, the uh, commander-in-chief, as Hezbollah gave back in February, where he warned military operatives to not use their cell phones out of concerns that they may be intercepted by Israeli intelligence. And he thought that maybe if they use these low-tech devices, the pagers, it would be safer. But obviously, you fast forward to today, and what we're seeing is a massive intelligence and security breach, and now Hezbollah is on the defensive. Jumana, is this a case of escalation to de-escalate, or do we think, or do you think, how you're reading the tea leaves, Israel wants to escalate to escalate. What happens next? I think, Anne-Marie, that we are seeing a whole new level of warfare. And what we have seen since October 7 is daily crossfire, exchange of fire on that border uh, with Israel, the northern border. Uh, what this has meant now is we're moving towards a new type of warfare, and this is cyber warfare. A lot more question marks, a lot of different operators going behind the scenes. If you look at all of the cybersecurity comments that came through yesterday, trying to understand exactly what happened, it's still not clear. But what has emerged is uh, th this, this feeling that these devices had been tampered with in a potentially uh, a different country. And therefore, uh, the shipments that came through just a week ago, according to Al-Akhbar, this is a, a news agency that's closely associated to Hezbollah, were all contaminated with these explosive devices. So it does raise a lot of questions about the new type of warfare that we're entering into. But certainly, Lebanon is on a high state of alert. And even if you rewind back um, earlier on in the day yesterday, the Israeli government, the Prime Minister Netanyahu, was saying that they've got a new war objective now, and that is ensuring that security on the northern border uh, is, is taken care of so that people can start returning back to their homes. Because since October 7, there has been this daily exchange of crossfire and people have been forced to evacuate. And so they want to resume some normalcy. And the question is, unless there is a diplomatic solution, will this open the door to a larger scale operation? Shocking scenes yesterday. Jamana, thank you. As always, Jamana Basachi there of Bloomberg leading our coverage out of the region. Crude right now negative by more than 1%. 7027 on WTI. Brent crude 7280. Listen to this for a forecast that comes from Max Layton, a city, thinking prices will actually grind lower 
over the next three to six months and average $60 a barrel in 2025. Max joins us now for more. Max, we've got plenty to talk about and lots of commodities to discuss as well. But let's start with crude. Why isn't this a bigger factor in your outlook? Sure. Uh, I mean, just to clarify, in the short run, we, we're seeing a lot of upside risks in the oil market. We have an average price forecast of $75, uh, $74 for Brent uh, for the fourth quarter of this year. So there's upside risk from what's going on in the Middle East in terms of potential uh, risk premium in the market, Russia, Ukraine, uh, hurricane risk, Libya's outage is ongoing and you know may go on for months and months. Uh, the market may continue to get a boost from the Fed cutting cycle in the very short run. But I guess the broader dynamic, we, which we've been highlighting since at least January of this year, is that there's slowing demand growth, uh, whether it's led by China or just a broader global cyclical weakness. And it's being met by solid non-OPEC plus supply growth. So OPEC plus has a problem uh, and they have a problem with spare capacity. They've been cutting for two years. So, you know, they've got a big decision to make in early December. There's a question about whether oil is getting increasingly divorced from the economic cycle in terms of an indicator and whether there is this divergence between China and the U.S. that makes it increasingly confusing, as well as the transformation of a lot of the energy ecosystems to electric vehicle and other uh, types of renewable energy sources. How much do you attribute that transformation or, or transition as part of that sort of decline in demand? Yeah, we think that's a big, big part of the story. So there's a like a structural part of it, which is being led by China, which is investing massively in the energy transition. And in response to shocks, China is probably going to double down on that investment in the energy transition and specifically uh, going to accelerate the uh, uh, the um, adoption of electric vehicles, which you know, retail adoption was around 54% last month uh, of electric vehicles, which is up about 20 percentage points over the last 12 months. So massive, you know, China's basically basically solving all the problems we talk about in the West with respect to electric vehicles. Um, we talk about range anxiety, price anxiety, uh, charging anxiety, weather anxiety, their latest vehicles, the latest batteries. Some of them haven't been mass produced yet in terms of the vehicles and the batteries, but you know they're solving these problems and it's evidence in the data and it's evidence in the slowing in oil demand growth. And there's a cyclical element as well, which is you know why the Fed's most likely going to be starting a pretty aggressive cutting cycle this week. What I find fascinating is that oil used to be sort of a geopolitical uh, temperature taker or at least an economic temperature taker. And now it seems to be shifting a bit to precious metals. You expect that precious metals will actually get arguably the biggest boost from some of the rate cuts that we're expecting to see. Can you explain why that is and why that's maybe the better uh, macroeconomic indicator right now than oil? Yeah, we're really excited about precious metals, um, particularly silver, but also gold. Um, but the reason why silver looks super interesting right now is, you know, I spoke a bit about how oil is negatively exposed to China's energy transition. Silver is positively exposed to China's energy transition. So China has this bifurcated economy where energy transition sectors are relatively strong and the cyclical, the housing, the private sector, it's, uh, the, uh, the prices of property, wealth impacts are all super negative, sentiments quite negative in China. Silver is also bullishly exposed to that. The retail, retail buying of silver just started to pick up over the last couple of months. You're seeing the first kind of imports of silver in bar and coin form into China that we've seen for years and years and years. So silver is kind of uniquely exposed in a bullish way to both the bearish part of China and the bullish part of China. It's going into solar panels on the energy transition side in particular, as well as EVs. Um, yeah, and obviously both gold and silver are, are super exposed to lower real rates in the US, weakening US growth, uh, growth fears, uh, and we're going to get probably get a big wealth shift into gold and silver from US and, and global investors exposed to their own regional cutting cycles. Max, do you continuously see central banks buying gold to diversify away from the US dollar? Uh, continuously, certainly we see it for the next 12 to 18 months. Um, tough to forecast beyond that horizon. Uh, that's that's a long enough horizon for me. But yes, certainly the, the, there's enough treasury holdings left to sell uh, to buy more, much more gold. 
Max, we've got to do more of this. Appreciate the clarity on the outlook, sir. Thank you. Max Layton there of City. Pressure. On a gold market on silver, on precious metals. He likes precious metals. I think he said he gets excited about precious metals. A lot of people are getting excited about highs. precious metals. That's enough to get people excited, especially with his point that they're exposed to both the good sides and the bad sides of China's economic cycle. A really compelling point there. Just short of a record on the screen this morning. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere. With your Bloomberg Brief, here's Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. Senior U.S. and Chinese economic officials are expected to meet this week in Beijing. The Biden administration is seeking to once again confront China over alleged industrial overcapacity. The U.S. delegation includes officials from the Treasury and Federal Reserve Board. It will be led by the Treasury Undersecretary for International Affairs, Jay Shambaugh. BlackRock and Microsoft are teaming up in what will be one of the largest efforts to build AI infrastructure. The companies will seek $30 billion of private equity capital to build warehouses and energy sources. They will mostly be U.S.-based, but a portion of the funds will go to U.S. partner countries. That adds to Microsoft's already large AI ambitions with $13 billion invested in open AI and larger plans to overhaul its product line. Novo Nordisk says Ozempic is expected to be one of the targets for a price cut in bargaining with the U.S. Medicare program. The Inflation Reduction Act allows the U.S. to directly negotiate with manufacturers for the first time. The 15 drugs targeted for the next round are expected to be announced early next year. Ozempic has a list price of just under $970 per month. That's your brief, John. Ridiculous. Danny, thank you. More from Danny in 30 minutes' time. Up next, struggling to find consensus. It's not just that we don't know what the destination is. We don't know what the journey is. We have these disagreements both within the FOMC and also between the market and the end, what seems to be the consensus, if there is one, on the Fed. Special coverage a little bit later on that Federal Reserve decision. Mohamed El Arian in studio going into the decision at the other side and following the news conference as well. Look out for that a little bit later on. Up next on the program, we'll catch up with Torsten Slog of Apollo. Your scores this morning and good morning look like this. Positive by 0.1% on the S&P 500, pushing just a little bit higher. Bond yields are two, up almost two basis points on a 10-year, 366.24. Under Savannah's this morning, struggling to find consensus. It's not just that we don't know what the destination is. We don't know what the journey is. Also, there's disagreement as how quickly will Fed officials go from backward looking, data dependence, to forward leaning. So we have these disagreements both within the FOMC and also between the market and the end, what seems to be the consensus, if there is one, on the Fed. So this is, a, for me, it's a fascinating time, but it is also a very confusing time. I think most of us are confused. So here's the latest. Investors bracing for the Fed's first interest rate cut in more than four years and looking for answers to a lot of big questions. Torsten Slock of Apollo saying, despite surveys showing that the consensus expecting a soft landing, rates markets are pricing in a full-blown recession. The Fed's R-Star model says that neutral monetary policy would mean a Fed funds rate at 3%. But maybe this estimate is wrong. Torsten joins us now for more. Torsten, good morning to you, sir. Thank We've you. got a lot to work through. When they sit around on the committee, and they continue the conversation today, if it does indeed to continue. And they ask themselves, what's the biggest risk here? Upside risk to inflation or downside risk to growth? What answer do you think they come up with? I think that they would look at the dual mandate. And it is absolutely correct that inflation was 9.1 in the summer of 2022 and now is 2.5. So we've come a long, long way when it comes to inflation. But the other side is the dual mandate, namely full employment. Yes, the unemployment rate has gone up a bit, but literally all other economic activity indicators, real indicators for everything across GDP, as you saw yesterday, industrial production, retail sales, remain quite strong. So now you begin to sit and look at the real side of the economy and say, should I put a lot of weight on the unemployment rate going up a bit, because of, largely because of labor supply, or should I put more weight on all the other real economy indicators are actually still in relatively good shape. So I think that they would do it from the perspective of saying, what's the dual mandate saying, and where are we on the various indicators on the side of the dual so mandate? So do you take issue today with the decision of reducing interest rates, or take issue with the conversation about them returning back to 3% quickly? So I do think that it is the returning back to 3% that's problematic, because the 3% number, the R star number, or the terminal estimate that they have put out in the dot plot, that they now literally have on the New York Fed homepage, that R star, where we're going, is 3%. 
That turns out to be wrong, because if this were the case, monetary policy would be much more restrictive. And the incoming data, when you look at it, Atlanta Fed GDP now at 3% yesterday, that's not restrictive. If you look at what happened to industrial production yesterday, that's not restrictive either. If you look across the board on a wide range of indicators, it doesn't look like monetary policy is particularly restrictive. Most importantly, in credit and in private credit, you're seeing that loan default rates are going down. If we had a recession, Default rates would not be going down, they would be going up. Even if we had a slowdown, it would be the same. So given this vast majority of indicators, when you look out of the window, still telling you that things are actually still okay, then it is problematic to sit there with high conviction and saying that monetary policy is very restrictive. We're in a kumbaya kind of mood. We're trying to find consensus. And one thing that strikes me about what you said is it doesn't sort of... Uh, really uh, reduce the need for a 50 basis point rate cut today. You're just saying longer term, maybe they should push back against some of the expectations for 200 basis points of reduction quickly like that to get down to that level that is closer to what may be neutral. Is that correct? Well, if our style, where we're going, the term with Fed funds rate, if we think that's three, but it actually is more like four, four and a half, then you're not in a rush to cut 50. Then you could just take 25 and say, if we need to get to four and a half, that's just 75, 100 basis points lower than where we are. So there's no need to hurry to lower interest rates if you have that we don't need to get quickly down to three, but we just need to get to four and a half. So it does become quite important whether it's 25 or 50 because it signals whether we are in a hurry to do something or whether we still have time to look at the incoming data that still continues to be strong. What in the incoming data makes you concerned about a reacceleration of inflation, which would be the other side of the mandate that could potentially uh, be negative if the Fed were to cut overly aggressively? Well, one obvious area is, of course, housing, uh, given housing has a weight of 35% in the CPI basket, but now you see the NHB has begun to increase. Of course, if you lower mortgage rates dramatically, as we've seen here over the last three, four weeks, that will also give a boost to housing. We're seeing some of the housing indicators show signs of turning around, and with an already low supply of houses, and therefore inventory being very, very low by historical standards, you could have that housing inflation. At least if you take the chart of Case Schiller and overlay that with OER, it does look like we could get a rebound over the next months in the housing components of the CPI. If the Fed comes out and cuts 25 basis points, but Powell has very dovish language, would that be to the markets almost equal to a 50 basis point cut? Well, I do think that exactly the communication around what they do today. So I think that they will go 25. But if they do go 50, how they talk about this will be extremely important. So that's why the dot plot coming along today with a statement is very, very critical for rates expectations. Markets are obviously pricing 10 cuts through this cycle, which is basically based on the idea that we got to get down to neutral, we got to get down to neutral and 3% as quickly as possible. But if the dot plot suddenly now tells you, well, maybe you're not getting 10 cuts, 10 cuts maybe we're getting only six, seven cuts, then of course that will also mean that markets will look at that and say, well, maybe we are overpricing this and maybe we are too hooked on, excuse me, the model in the Fed's basement, namely our star, rather than going up into the living room and looking at the incoming data. I want to ask you a quick question on fiscal. The U.S. government every day pays out billions when we pay out our interest. Three billion. With with the Fed cutting, how much less money does the government actually need to pay on our interest? Yeah, so we calculated that if the Fed cuts one percentage point, the interest payments on a daily basis will decline from three billion to two and a half billion. But that's still a very, very significant number relative to where we've been historically. So you're absolutely right. Lowering interest rates helps in terms of debt servicing costs, but in the background we of course still have debt levels continuing to rise. And that's of course creating challenges for the fiscal situation. Maybe in the near term it will be a little bit of relief, but down the road this problem is of course not going away. Are we suggesting John Williams is in the basement? Well, I'm just saying that the focus here on what it is that is the narrative. Also, if you think carefully about what is the ECB saying, what is the Bank of England saying, they are not framing their decisions for monetary policy according to some, excuse me, academic Kalman filter for what's happening with our star. They are framing their debate as what is the incoming data doing. It's so in that different. sense, I love our star and I think everything that goes into it. And trust me, I have I spent a lot of time thinking about and I have a PhD in economics. It is a very interesting thing to spend time you. on. But I'm just telling you that if you think about the incoming data, then putting it up on the scale, maybe the incoming data should get a bit more weight. Get out of the basement and get in the living room and look out the window. (laughs) Nobody puts John Williams in the basement. (laughs) All I can say is, you know, there is this feeling that maybe we are making a little bit too much or placing too much emphasis on certain measures that are, you know, fuzzy or dusty. Jim Bianco of Bianco Research made this point. There's a great divide right now, you know, going into this decision between market pricing and 
economists. In our survey, more than 100 economists surveyed in our survey. Not even 10% of them think a 50 basis point cut happens today. That's how big the spread is between professional economists at the moment and market participants. How do you make a move that is outsized at a time where you're only able to see lagging indicators and the data itself is kind of contradictory? We're seeing different signals from, say, the mortgage market versus, say, auto loan delinquencies. Torsten, this was wonderful. You're one of the best and we appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Tossin Slog there of Apollo. Up next on the program, Alicia Levine of BMY Wealth, Mike Shepard of Bloomberg News, Herman Chan of Bloomberg Intelligence, and Greg Peters of PGM from New York City, the second hour of Bloomberg Surveillance, just around the corner. It's really not a bad economy, it's a good economy, and I don't think it calls for any drastic Fed action. Given how the Fed is behaving so slowly that they could put us in a recession. The soft landing narrative can probably survive this year, particularly if the Fed is a bit proactive. The total sum of the rate cuts may matter more than how they do it. For me, it's a fascinating time, but it is also a very confusing time. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Ferro, Lisa Abramowitz, and Anne-Marie Hordern. The second hour of Bloomberg Surveillance starts right now, live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. That Fed decision is just around the corner, and these are the scores going into it. Equities very close to all-time highs, and bond yields close to the lows of the year. Equity futures up a tenth of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, up by two tenths. On a Russell, the small caps, Lisa, up by a tenth. This is a market that really has hinged and really gained on this idea that this is a Fed that is squarely focused on the labor market and preventing any further weakening. That signal, frankly, was the clarion call to just go into risk and go big because the Fed wanted to get ahead of any downturn before the signs even became clear. Market participants will tell you this can go either way, 25 or 50. It's finally balanced. How many times have you heard that over the last few weeks? Our survey economist says anything but. It screams the overwhelming majority is looking for 25 here and not 50. It's a very different conversation on Wall Street on the south side if you listen to The Economist. Take a look at, at the Atlanta Fed's uh, GDP now forecast, which actually rose to 2.99% yesterday in the latest reading. That compares to well below that in the last Fed meeting when they did not cut rates. So it raises this question, if you have GDP forecasts that are accelerating, if you have other measures that are actually improving, including certain consumer spending and retail sales components, where is the impetus to go big? And that's where you get the real debate uh, that you're having right now. Well, the market felt like it was leaning towards 25 basis points until we got those articles in the Wall Street Journal and in the Financial Times. But it's a knife's edge just on this show within the last 60 minutes. Julian Emanuel, 50 basis points. Torsten Slock, 25 basis points. And then Greg Peters, who's coming up, it says it's the should or could debate. And we won't know until this afternoon. Ian Lingen of BMO mentioned him a few times already. Title of his piece yesterday, Disappointment Guaranteed. Is disappointment all but guaranteed later on this afternoon? Because if they go by 50, it's already baked in. And if they don't go by 50, then, wow, you're going to get blown up if you have a real conviction trade here. There's a question now about uh, whether this market is priced to perfection either way. And ultimately, we'll have to see. I mean, maybe and Jay Powell has outdubbed us every single time. Maybe he will come through once more. For the previous seven meetings, yes. every single meeting this two years rallied. And the yield has dropped for the best part of 12 months. Is that going to change later on this afternoon? About five or ten minutes ago, we had a conversation with Torsten Slock of Apollo, and I thought he brought up a really, really important point. The point on the ECB versus the Federal Reserve. And the way they talk about reducing interest rates. Here in the United States, we're having this conversation. We're looking for guidance, conviction around a return to 3%, to neutral, normalization. Over at the ECB, they're like meeting by meeting, 25 maybe. Wait and see. We'll talk in a few months' time. It's a very different conversation over there. Yeah, you've made the point that if the Fed were to talk like that, well, watch out. It starts know. with crater. Yeah, and essentially, this is how much this market has conviction that the Fed is leaning heavily into the dual mandate, in particular, one side of the dual mandate, as Mohamed El Arian has talked about. This is now a one-mandate Fed, which is to support a labor market that has shown signs of cracks. That said, I mean, there's a lot of disagreement among a lot of uh, luminaries. Jeff Gunlock came out and said, we're already in recession. 50 is just the beginning. They might already be too late. And then you have uh, Ray Dalio saying, oh, look, 25 on the margins, you don't really need it. You've got Torsten Slock saying the same thing. I mean, this is a heated debate at a moment where it seems like it just doesn't have the same kind of inflationary pressure to gut check the other side. I love it when you do voices. Is that Jeff Gunlack? 
Why does Jeff sound like Tom? <laughs> well, I, I just, I feel like you need to kind of give, look, I read to my kids a lot when they were younger. And so I can't help you it. You put voices I always, on. Was always it the same voice on. all the time? No, I, well, I actually do different voices, but I don't want to be <laughs> offensive in any way and actually create, you know, true impressions. Share, do you want to keep going with some this? more of that a little bit later. Equity futures on the S&P, positive by a tenth of 1%. A little bit of a lift here in this equity market. In the bond market, bonds a little lower, yields a bit higher, up by a basis point or two on a 10-year, 366.24. Coming up this hour, we'll catch up with Alicia Levine of BNY Wealth on the odds of a soft landing. Bloomberg's Herman Chan on bets that rate cuts will boost regional banks. And Greg Peters of Peach and Fixed Income, expecting the Fed to go big. We begin with our top story. Stocks close to all-time highs as traders wait for the Fed's easing cycle to begin. Alicia Levine of BMY writes in the following. We think the Fed could cut 50 basis points and believe the macro data are pointing to a soft landing, though some areas of concern growing over the last few months include softness in the labour market and stress for the bottom quintile consumer. Alicia joins us now for more. Alicia, good morning to you. Good morning. Let's run with the question we started the hour with. Is disappointment all but guaranteed a little bit later this afternoon? So the, the short answer is yes, because of the pricing in the markets. It's 40-60, it's 50-50. It's it's You're guaranteed that one side or the other of this decision is going to be offsides in this because the bets are being made on it. And so what's really unusual about the meeting today in the press conference is that there's kind of a lack of conviction in the market itself. And so you're guaranteed to have some disappointment. I think, you know, we think that the Fed probably should go 50 if you're really looking at the labor market and some of the downward revisions show that the labor market normalized earlier in the year than we thought when we thought the labor market was hot. Actually, it was normalized months before. And so if you're looking for that inflection point, this would be a really good time to cut rates. However, because the market is off sides on this and the Fed hasn't had time to really signal it to the market, that the, you know, the, the dark period came right after that labor report in, uh, on September 5th. So yep. I, I think they're going to go 25, but I think the data suggests 50. I'm not saying I'm right. I'm just saying that I hate you know, it. Like, they're in a tough spot to do 50 because it's not fully been discussed out in the market itself. You're not the first person who's identified the spread between what they think the Fed will do and what the Fed should do. We heard that in the previous conversation as well. I want your understanding of where the conviction is at the Federal Reserve. I'm pleased you brought up that word. This feels like a low conviction moment for markets. Does this Federal Reserve have any conviction about the future rate path? So that's a great question. I, I think to some extent, yes. It's really the data have been so all over the place. You know, the retail sales data better than better than expected. The labor force data starting to show cracks, but not on the new claims. It's really all over the place. I think there is a low conviction for today, but the path is convicted. Meaning, we're embarking on a rate cutting cycle. It's going to last the next 18 months at least. And so I think you'll get conviction on the path, which is why today can be low conviction because the path is clearer. And so the conversation of, well, it really doesn't matter whether they do 25 or 50 because we know what this path is. I think that's the right way to frame this for markets. The only thing I'll say is last week, you know, the S&P was up 4%, NASDAQ was up 6%. As the market started pricing in that 50 basis points of cuts into the end of the week. So as you started getting that conversation in markets, because don't forget, Monday was only 12 percent chance of 50 basis points. By Friday, we were about 50, 51 percent. Markets rallied and you know, the equity market rallied right into that. So could you see a sell off if it's 25? Maybe. Maybe. Which is the reason why disappointment is almost guaranteed on all sides, because even if you get the 50 basis points, can they be dovish enough to then confirm the rest of the path that everybody has priced in? Is the market wrong in pricing in so many rate cuts through the end of next year, simply because the response we're already seeing is mortgage applications are up. You're starting to see consumer confidence tick back up. There is a sense of mission accomplished. Let's get it going. So I don't think the market... Well, there's about 240 basis points of cuts priced into the end of 2025. We think that's a lot. And we think that's a lot because we still see the U.S. economy being in pretty good shape. And it seems that the credit sensitive areas, which are the ones that have been contracting in the last year or so, are the ones loosening up even before the Fed starts. So I don't think the Fed needs to cut two and a half percent to get for the Fed funds rate to be at neutral. I think they can cut less. 
And so I think it's a lot. But what we've seen is that the market gets, you know, really overexcited on the number of rate cuts in the future 12 to 18 months and then slowly takes it back as the economy comes in better than expected. I think you'll see a story of the same going forward. You know, in the end, the Fed should cut 100 basis points here, right, to get going. And after that, you really have to see where the economy is going. So if they start at 25, they'll do 75 for the year. If they start at 50, they'll do 100. I don't think either are that extraordinarily different for where the markets are. This is the reason why I use voices, John, because ultimately <laughs> we treat the market as though it were an adolescent and we're reading a story and different narratives that come out every single day. There is this question about whether stocks are kind of damned if they do and damned if they don't, because at this point they're kind of hinging on that 240 basis point rate cutting projection while also hinging on ongoing strength that potentially could negate that need. So so for, for the stock market and for earnings, you know, the, the strength of the economy is much more important than where interest rates are, right? So we need growth and we need earnings growth. And that's what gets a higher stock market. That's what propels it. So I will take the strength in the economy any day over a much lower Fed funds rate, right? Because you'd rather have that in the economy. So I don't think the market is, is in trouble here. We do think the market ends higher into the end of the year. Some volatility, seasonal, traditional around elections. This one's close, very close so far. I think if it becomes less close, maybe the market can get out of the volatility range. But um, we, don't think, we don't think stocks are at risk here simply because we think the earnings are coming in and the margins are much better than expected. We've not even seen a rate cut yet and we've already seen some big changes. Mortgage applications data just came out moments ago. Mike McKee shared some bullet points with us, so I'll read them to you. MBA mortgage applications index rose 14.2% in the week ending September 13th after rising more than 1% of the previous week. Mortgage apps now rising for a fourth consecutive week. Listen to some of these numbers. Purchases up by 5.4% after rising 1.8% in the prior week. Refis increased 24.2% after rising 0.9% in the prior week. Now, if you want to extend the cycle, is this how we're going to extend the cycle? Well, this is exactly the issue that we were kind of hinting at here, which is you're already seeing the relief and it's already pointing to a reacceleration in activity in certain areas of the market that haven't yet even really seen this incredible amount of pain. It just raises the question whether they need to go that far and how much we start to worry about the other side of the mandate in short order. Alicia, your thoughts on those numbers that I just read out. What do you think? Well, it's great. It's, it's great Some to see the mortgage numbers, market move they? again. It's great. Um, Look, it, it's not surprising. I mean, we thought that as soon as mortgages had a five handle in front of it, and we're, we're very close to that, we're getting close to five, you'd, you'd unlock the entire mortgage market here and you'd start seeing existing homeowners move on. But if we do this in the low sixes, we're having a conversation about taking Fed funds back to three. I'm just wondering if we even get anywhere close based on the action we're Because it's, what it's telling you is people, there's so much demand out there for housing and for mortgages that it, it, the rates are now 150 basis points lower than they were a year ago on mortgages. People are moving. They're moving and we can always refinance. If they go lower, people can refinance. So this is a great first move. So to, to your point, I, I think it's the rate move here, despite the fact that overall in the aggregate, the U.S. economy was relatively immune to the rate hiking cycle. What you're seeing is the areas that were susceptible and, and, and froze up because of the tightness of credit, they're loosening right now. So that's why I don't think the Fed needs to cut 250 basis points. If they do signal a significant rate cutting cycle, do you buy gold? Look, gold doesn't have a yield. So we don't, we don't you, know, you know. You get my point. You I, start I do get your point. Inflation. Like, do you, you, get, do you yeah. get some risk off yeah. trades? Yes. Yes, but you know, in the end, we, that's not the, an allocation that we do for our clients. There are other ways of doing that. We like bonds, we like munis. Munis are still cheap compared to bonds. That's what we're telling our clients. This is what you do in a rate cutting cycle. But we're convicted in the path, right? Meaning wh whatever the Fed does today, rates are going lower. That's good for risk assets, that's great for bonds, it's great for munis, so the client should be there. You know, the other thing is um, w there's still $6.3 trillion of cash Right out there. And there's a lot of discussion when that's going to move. So what we saw after the global financial crisis, it didn't move. It stayed. You know, you don't see this big drop even when markets recover. I think in this particular case, as refinancing risk gets higher when, you know, when the, when the Fed funds rate moves lower, 
in the next few months very quickly, you'll start seeing some of that move into bonds as, as, as an alternative to cash. Alicia, it's good to see you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Alicia Levine there of BNY. Equity futures just about positive on the S&P with an update on stories elsewhere. With your Bloomberg Brief, here's Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. Citadel Securities has shelved its plan to join the ranks of bond dealers that trade directly with the Fed. For nearly a decade, the firm had set its sight on that goal, seeing it as part of the path to becoming dominant, dominant in Treasury trading. People familiar, though, say Citadel has already cemented its status as a key market maker and now no longer sees the need to become a primary dealer with the Fed. The CEO of Italian beverage company Campari is stepping down after just five months on the job. Shares down by 5% in Europe trade. His resignation follows a slump in shares, to be specific, a 15% drop while he was on the job. Before his short stint, his predecessor had served as the CEO for 17 years and expanded the Aperol maker through a series of acquisitions. The merger between Hawaiian and Alaska Air is one step closer to becoming a reality. The U.S. Department of Transportation gave the green light to the merger after the carriers agreed to institute new consumer protections. Now, under the terms of the agreement, Alaska and Hawaiian must protect the value of loyal program rewards, maintain existing services on key routes, and preserve support for rural services. That's your brief, John. Danny, thank you. We'll see you again in about 30 minutes' time. Up next on the program, Biden's big bet on chips. Our Chips and Science Act meant the private companies from around the world are now investing literally tens of billions of dollars to build new chip factories right here in America. That conversation just around the corner, live from New York City this morning. Good morning. The Fed decision just around the corner. Equity futures going into it positive by a tenth of 1% on the S&P. Bond yield tire by two basis points. 366.43 in foreign exchange. The dollar near the weakest level of the year so far. Euro dollar 111.26. And this event is this morning. Biden's big bet on chips. After years of importing 90% of our semiconductor chips from abroad, which America invented that, those chips, our Chips and Science Act meant the private companies from around the world are now investing literally tens of billions of dollars to build new chip factories right here in America. So here's the latest. Intel confirming its eligibility for $3 billion in federal funding to manufacture military chips. The government betting big on the company to boost domestic production in an effort to reduce reliance on Asia. With the latest is Bloomberg's Mike Shepard. Shep, walk us through the latest and the latest developments over the last few days on this front. Well, there's really been a lot happening with respect to Intel. We've chronicled over the years, thanks to our colleague Ian King, all of the company's struggles, and they really reached an inflection point last month. We saw that really rough earnings outlook that they gave uh, toward the end of August that sent the company's share sliding by the most in, in decades. And since then, everybody's been wondering, where do they go from here? Well, the company has had a board meeting. They've decided to cut more than 15,000 jobs, try to trim $10 billion in spending. But now we're getting a few other bits of good news this week. One of them is this uh, uh, news from the company and from the Pentagon and Commerce Department that Intel is eligible for up to $3 billion for military chip production. And this accompanies uh, roughly $20 billion in loans and grants that Intel is due to receive for commercial production under the Chips and Science Act that the president was just talking about in that clip. Uh, the company also announced this week a partnership with Amazon World Services to produce a multi-billion dollar uh, uh, and it's a multi-billion dollar initiative to produce semiconductors for artificial intelligence for Amazon's cloud computing arm. This is potentially more significant than the uh, uh, military chip we were just talking about, only because it shows that uh, Intel is developing a commercial customer base that could feed some of the new plants and support some of the new plants that uh, Biden was talking about and hoping to see built. Shep, this isn't just about building manufacturing bases in the United States. This is a national security concern. Why is the administration coming out and touting this, but at the same time looking to block, now there's an extension, when it comes to 
Nippon Steel, an ally of the United States, a Japanese company, and their $14 billion takeover of U.S. steel? Well, on the steel front, it's uh, very much a politically charged question because uh, Nippon Steel's attempt to buy U.S. steel, there is such symbolism and it is so freighted with U.S. steel being an iconic company uh, for the U.S. and especially for President Joe Biden, who hails from Pennsylvania. Uh, so the resistance politically to that proposal it is not surprising. I think we have to separate a little bit the national security front on uh, chips because that is a really core and consequential technology that if the U.S. loses any ground to China uh, on this front, um, it would be a potential risk militarily in the Pacific Basin. Shep, do you know what the national security concerns are when it comes to U.S. steel and Nippon steel? I, you know, one of the concerns is that, you know, Nippon Steel actually does a fair amount of business in China. And would U.S. Uh, would U.S. Steel's uh, production somehow be vulnerable to shifts if, you know, once the company takes over, uh, if the transaction were ultimately improved, uh, approved and it is not looking terribly favorable? would some of the production be shifted over there? And if U.S. Steel makes some advances uh, domestically and you know perfects some of its techniques, would those get transferred somehow to production in, in China? So what they're worried about is the nexus of uh, U.S. production with Chinese production that Nippon Steel will ultimately have control over uh, should it somehow pull off a, trans a completion of this deal. I call me call me cynical here, but when I saw that it was pushed back until after the election, this particular decision with Nippon Steel, I thought to myself, well, doesn't that make it convenient for a lot of the politicians? They can rail against it, say they're completely, uh, you know, for keeping U.S. businesses domestic and their entire ownership, and then approve it later when it seems like there's no better option really for U.S. Steel. Is that the right way to read this? Well, uh, Lisa, I'll share your cynicism. Uh, it really did look like a convenient move to push it after the election to also remove it as an issue. If the decision were made uh, before November 5th, that would expose uh, the current Democratic nominee and uh, presidential candidate Kamala Harris to accusations that no matter which way it goes, uh, it would somehow be harming U.S. industry. And if they decided to approve it, it would hurt uh, the party standing with union workers whose votes and support they really need uh, uh, come November 5th. Hey, Shep, appreciate the update down in Washington. Bloomberg's Mike Shepard with the latest on several fronts. I think Nippon Steel, though, underlines one of the biggest issues that market participants have with this election. The difference between how people campaign and how they might govern and how much daylight there is in between. And because there is so much daylight, potentially even on a story like this, it's very hard to predict what things are going to look like in 2025 and beyond. The reason why I'm completely shocked every time there's a massive move in U.S. Steel's uh, stocks is simply because there are people still wagering a lot of money on these potential decisions that might come down the pike. There's always a gap between some of the campaign promises and what happens later. I don't know that we've ever had such a big vacuum of an idea of what actually could transpire depending on who wins and what the congressional makeup is. And that's one reason why people are just ignoring it altogether, because how do you bet on something that's just a complete unknown? Well, Kaylee put it best this morning, this Venn diagram between the Harris camp and the Trump camp, when you look at things like taxes, how many times have they ended up in the middle when it comes to no tax on tips, child tax credit being expanded? Now, all of a sudden, Donald Trump is for lifting and expanding the cap on salt, something that Schumer just told me a few weeks ago, for sure, if he maintains his job, he is going to make sure that they get rid of that cap. So there's this idea that maybe when it comes to tax policy, there will be some bipartisan effort, or I is it totally just campaign agree. promises? No, I totally agree. I think there is almost a bias, some kind of reflex, reflexive attitude to all of this, that you'll just have divided government. None of this stuff's going to happen. I think you have a sweet of proposals now on the Republican side where you could get some kind of agreement on the Democratic side if you end up with a Trump White House all over again. And the SALT tax break, the SALT reduction deduction is one of those issues along with several others too. The interesting thing about all of the issues where there's bipartisan support, they all spend money. None of them really increase the revenues of the government. Just putting that out there. Boy, the deficit. That deficit's getting a little bit bigger.
Just saying. That way, yeah, just a little bit. Up next on the program, Bloomberg's Herman Chan on expectations rate cuts could boost regional banks. That conversation just around the corner. You're watching Bloomberg TV. Two hours away from the opening bell, equity futures on the S&P up by a tenth of 1%, adding just a little bit more weight to the recent rally, up by two tenths of 1% on the Nasdaq 100. But let's switch up the board, turn the page and get into the bond market story. The two-year yield looks like this, 362.13, just adding another basis point or two to the front end of the yield curve. We saw the bond market cheapen a bit yesterday as well, Lisa, going into the Fed's two-day meeting. As it concludes, you get the feeling people want to give just a little bit back in the bond market after a big rally over the past month. Books almost closed, so basically take some chips off the table. That's sort of what this feels like as people come around to that idea that you were talking about earlier. Is, uh, is Are people bound for disappointment either way? Just baked. Uh, into how much this market has already moved ahead of the Fed meeting. That unlocked just a bit of dollar strength as well in yesterday's session, and some of that continues elsewhere. If you switch to the board and get to the foreign exchange market, we'll sit on dollar yen. Dollar yen re-imposing a little bit of strength on the FX market on the yen side of things. Dollar yen down to 141.73. Is this turning out to be no longer the big trade to watch in foreign exchange as we go into this decision a little bit later? Is this still looking stretched to you, this time from the other direction? Yeah, well, this is sort of uh, the big question. Have we shifted too quickly to the longs from the short position on the Japanese yen? And is this sort of uh, not necessarily the same kind of disruptor that it was back then? Have we washed out all of the short positioning with respect to the yen and gotten to more of an equilibrium? We shall see. I think that there is more two-way risk now just simply because the positioning isn't as lopsided. And so people aren't watching it as much. I mean, it seems like maybe the Bank of Japan can take the night off. Might make the other argument that maybe the Positioning's gone too far the other way now. Right. 140, Good evening, Tokyo. We know you're watching. Under surveillance this morning, U.S. officials saying Israel planted explosive materials inside thousands of pages that targeted Hezbollah in Lebanon. Several people were killed and nearly 3,000 were wounded. Stunning pictures coming out of the country. Absolutely. And this really erodes trust within Hezbollah because you had the head of Hezbollah, Nasrallah, coming out and telling individuals not to use smartphones degrade, go to things like pagers, because we don't want to make sure that Israelis could infiltrate our network. The United States coming out saying, Anthony Blinken right now speaking in Cairo, our team on the ground saying that he's telling um, reporters there the U.S. did not know about these incidents and that broadly speaking, the United States has been clear about the importance of all parties avoiding steps that could further escalate the conflict. And that's the question. Was this escalate escalation to de-escalate or is this escalation to potentially see broader escalation? You know, it's a great point. And that's, I think, what a lot of people in markets have been watching. And just from a market perspective, there are a lot of uh, very humanitarian other issues that are at play here. But from a market perspective, this is uh, sort of this existential question overhanging some of the complacency that we see. And uh, the question of are we accurately pricing the risk of that kind of escalation that Israel has said that it wants and Hezbollah has been, I mean, they've been lobbing missiles at each other for quite a while. That's really a key question at a time where that ceasefire negotiations, I think, has sent Blinken back to the region for the 10th time, not really making much headway. The message that they're sending from Israel, if this indeed was the Israelis and many suspect it was, is pretty clear. We'll find you. And we don't even have to come into the country to do so. We saw this in Iran, what, a month or two ago? Saw a similar story. We don't have to be there to get you. We'll find you. Especially with a low-tech instrument that was used to avoid their surveillance earlier, which is the reason why it really raises the question, are they disrupting some of the communication among Hezbollah operatives right now? Because what are they going to use to communicate? You know, just uh, passing notes? I mean, at what point can you sort of uh, de-industrialize yourself at a time where that is the main method of communication? It's a complete breakdown of their operations right now and also complete erosion of trust. How do they communicate? And also, do they trust the devices that they're given, even though they were told to downgrade to less technological devices? Don't use smartphones anymore. Use pagers. The Israelis are saying to you, no matter what you use, we are going to find you. That's the latest out of the Middle East, the latest from our reporting here at Bloomberg. Let's share some of that with you. Sources telling us that Japan's Nippon Steel has been granted an extension to refile its $14 billion takeover plan of U.S. Steel, likely pushing the decision until after the presidential election. Nippon's takeover bid becoming a hot-button campaign issue over the last several months. So obviously the politics of this have to do everything with Pennsylvania. 
the fact that you have Harris, Trump, Biden all saying that they want to make sure that U.S. steel remains on American soil and they would block this agreement. So they have this grace period now of basically coming out, saying whatever they want, but knowing potentially the deal could still go through after the election. When it actually comes to CFIUS, clearly there's no consensus. If they're giving Nippon Steel another 90 days, restart those clocks, there's no consensus, according to the reporting, when it comes to the DOD and the State Department about if this is an actual national security concern. Huge story for Pennsylvania, so much so that we had a debate in Pennsylvania and hardly talked about it. Thoughts? Well, I mean, what did we talk about? Missed opportunity. For who? The debate questioners or the actual debatees? For Pennsylvania steelworkers and for markets and for foreign companies that want to know what it's going to be like to do business in the United States in the future and what is considered national security concern, especially when you consider Japan as an ally. I was watching some clips from the debate and some other interviews, and I was taking notes on how to avoid answering questions. Oh, I'm right. Do I that thought you were going to say forward. taking notes on how not to conduct interviews, but carry on. <laughs> well, I'm not going to go there. I will just say, though, that you can ask me a question, 25 or 50. Is it about 25 or 50 or it is about the American people and people who are suffering? out there who we are going to help by cutting any tax That's you not ever how you pay. start. That's Bravo, not how you 20, start. 28. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, how do you do it? 25 or 50. Yeah. I grew up middle class. <laughs> Let's turn to the page and get to this story. JP Morgan is in discussions with Apple about taking over its credit card program. I didn't. Anyway, the bank is among several potential suitors <laughs> after Goldman Sachs opted to ditch the partnership just last year. This, I think, is teeing up a larger conversation about the future of banking, et cetera, et cetera, particularly over at Goldman that's made a big turn recently. I'm really looking forward to earnings season. It's about a month away. I think it kicks off on October 11th with JP Morgan. And two very competing worries here, this question of just whether uh, lower rates are actually good or bad for banks, uh, whether net interest margin is going to come down significantly. And then on the other side, just the credit worthiness at a time when supposedly there is weak weakness in an economy that could be offset by some of these rate cuts, but not yet. So which is it? Is it the ally of the world or is it the JP Morgan concern or is it both? Just depending on which uh, sector of the banking universe you look at. JP Morgan year today up by 23 percent. That's quite a run. Let's talk about the regionals. Regional bank shares rallying as traders count down to the Fed's rate decision. Small and mid-sized lenders poised to see much needed relief with borrowing costs expected to fall for the first time in four years. Joining us now, Herman Chan of Bloomberg Intelligence. Herman, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you for Why do me. rate cuts help? Let's start there. Why yeah, is that an sure. important channel to alleviate some of the pain these lenders have been going through? In our view, there, there's three main reasons why the market's really enthusiastic about rate cuts and the banks as well. Number one, as you mentioned before, deposit costs will come down and deposit costs, as you can recall, have been a, a hindrance for banks with their net interest margins over the past year or so after the SVB failure. Number two, um, we could see potentially better credit quality, lower borrowing costs for their customers, so it could help lower the net interest, uh, net charge offs for, for the banks. And number three, we haven't seen a lot of loan growth given elevated interest rates. So lower rates could potentially spur some improved demand on that front. The word I'm interested in here is relief. Mm -hmm. Is this just a relief rally? And we've seen the regional banks on the KBD Bank Index up by something like 15% so far right. this quarter. We've seen the relief rally. Mm -hmm. Do you see a sustainable tailwind into right. 2025? I would agree that it's a relief rally, but you have to step back. We're, we're really just back to the levels of, of March of 2023 20, uh, before SVB failed. So we're just back to where we started. Um, it, it, I would also say that the banks are, are talking about improvement in net interest income for 2025. So there's still some potential tailwinds from repricing of fixed rate assets and the margin could stabilize with lower uh, deposit costs. So that, that's all helpful for, for banks going forward. So are high rates good for them mm -hmm. or are low rates good for them? Stability is good for them. So the expectation is we, we have um, a, a rate cycle that, that's more a, 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 uh, predictable versus what we had last time. Um, so that, that's what banks would like to see, stability, a positive sloping yield curve, and potential for, for uh, loan growth to return. So that, that would be the Goldilocks scenario. There's a real question about whether we understand the impulse that lower rates will have through some of the markets that have been the most stagnant. And I'm thinking of commercial real estate. I'm thinking of uh, real estate more generally. Right. Just anything having to do with property. And these banks are highly exposed to valuations that maybe haven't been fully reset because there has been no activity. So at what mm -hmm. point could you see ongoing resetting in prices that could be harmful to their bottom lines right. going forward with 
lower rates. Yeah, that is a risk. Uh, and, and that's something that, that, that the banking industry will still have to work through. Uh, I would point to the fact that the PNC CEO recently noted at an investor conference that we're still really only in the first inning of a shakeout in, in the office commercial real estate market. So there's still going to be more to come. So help us understand which part of the regionals we want to play then. Mm -hmm. Seemingly, it's going to lift all boats. Mm -hmm. Is it fair to say it lifts all boats? It, it will really depend. You, you have to dig deep into where the uh, interest rate positioning is for the balance sheets. But overall, um, banks have hedged a lot of the potential uh, downsides for lowest interest rates, uh, but it will be from bank to bank. This will sound somewhat snarky then. We need to identify the banks that really mismanage their interest rate risk when rates were rising, right. and they're the ones that benefit the most. Exactly. So, so banks, uh, you could point to banks like Comerica and Key Corp in the larger regional space that could uh, pick up that tangible book value that they lost uh, during the, the rising rate environment. I love that, John. I don't mean to sound snarky. But. Well, no, I think it raises an important question. <laughs> Relief rally or long-term bet? Are these management teams that I actually want to put money behind for the long term, given how badly they miss management interest rate risk on the way up? Mm -hmm. Right. So, so you can say that there's some unlocking of uh, the, the laggards during the past year will now be the beneficiaries of lower interest rates. So at this point... What is the right time to get into re uh, regional mm -hmm. banks? I mean, how much are you advising people? I know you're not going to recommend buy, sell, hold, whatever. But how much do you see people interested now versus, say, two months ago, and now people say the trade is up? Yeah, I, I think there, there's still some, some uh, optimism that, that we're, we're really over the hump. So over the past um, couple quarters or so, there was still some uh, potential for uh, margins to really stagnate. But the banks are over that cliff, and we're, we're actually at the we've, – we've, We've uh, hit the bottom of margins, and now there's potential for that to continue to, to upward slope uh, in 2025. So, so there's some positive sentiment out there. But there's, uh, on the other hand, there's still unknowns on where the economy is going. Is it going to be a soft landing, or are we actually going to hit a recession? So uh, I would point to that as well. So there's going to be some puts or takes. Herman, thank you, sir. Herman Chan of Bloomberg Intelligence on the latest with the regionals going into an important Federal Reserve decision later on this afternoon. With an update on stories elsewhere this morning with your Bloomberg Brief, here's Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. Chevron boss Mike Worth attacked the Biden admin's oil and gas policy, blaming it on pushing up prices and undermining energy security. Worth spoke in Houston at the Gas Tech Conference. He said the moratorium on new LNG export permits put politics over progress and would hurt climate efforts. The industry as a whole has pushed back on the policy as it struggles with a surplus of natural gas. Wizz Air says it won't provide any frills for passengers on the new Airbus SC jets. The aircraft will fly a route from London to Saudi next year at a low cost. Wizz Air is stripping away comforts like seat screens and reclining seats, and food will only be available at a cost. Private equity investor Steve Pagliuca is reportedly discussing a takeover of Paris-based football club Red Star. Red Star was bought by Miami-based 777 Partners in 2022, something that fans heavily protested at the time and even caused a game to be abandoned in one instance. Pagliuca already co-owns the Boston Celtics and the Italian football club at Atlanta. That's your brief, John. What a life. Danny, thank you. Gave us a hint, didn't he, in the last conversation, a few conversations ago, that maybe France would be where he's looking. He was interested in that. You said, are there any active conversations? There might be. I can't talk about it. Even I'm making dinner reservations at the weekend and Steve's looking at football clubs to buy. It's a very different life, isn't it? <laughs> Honestly, I want his life so badly. I want just a window into his life. What kind of, you know, how many games he goes to a year, how he gets there, whether he wears the flags. Steve. Help Jonathan's AC Milan. I know. Bruising defeat yesterday. Thank you. That was pretty <laughs> brutal to watch. I was hoping to escape that conversation. Three one. You Ooh. watched that, didn't you? I did. Liverpool yeah. did a great job. It was a good two minutes. Yep. <laughs> All right, let's move on. Sort of went downhill after that <laughs> yeah. quite quickly. It's like Muhammad Alarian versus Jonathan Farrow. That's what the game was yesterday, in more ways than one, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to make this any more painful for me? <laughs> Up next, the Feds. Big moment. The main thing for the bond market is. Whether it's 25 or 50, there's a ton priced into the bond market and it's going to be hard, you know, we think for, for the Fed to deliver um, all of that. That conversation up next, live from New York City this morning, you're watching Bloomberg TV.
Equities are calm, steady waters right now. Equity futures positive by a tenth of 1%, yields a bit higher by two basis points. Call it three now, nudging up a little bit, 367.18 on a 10 year, going into the Fed decision a little bit later on this afternoon. The bond market continues to cheapen across the curve, twos out to 30s. Under surveillance this morning, it's the Fed's big moment. The main thing for the bond market is whether it's 25 or 50, there's a ton priced into the bond market. and. It's going to be hard, you know, we think, for, for the Fed to deliver um, all of that um, based on what we know now. And that, that's kind of a recipe for a little bit of a backup in yields from here. We think it's very unlikely we're going back to some of the yields we've seen over the last 12 to 18 months. So here's the latest. Treasury yields are climbing going into the Fed decision at 2 p.m. Eastern time and Chairman Powell's press conference 30 minutes later. Greg Peters of PGM writing, we believe the Fed should cut by 50, considering the urgency to start an easing cycle that culminates at the neutral rate. Although it would be atypical, that is also why it may make sense at this point. Greg joins us now for more. So, Greg, let's pick up on that and welcome back to the show, buddy, as always. 50 basis points is what you think they should do or what you think they will do at 2 p.m. Eastern? Well, I mean, what they should do doesn't matter, right? It, it, it is what they will do. And quite frankly, it is unsure. Uh, and this is, this is rare, Jonathan, right? I mean, normally you have a pretty good expectation of what the Fed is going to do, right? So this is highly unusual. The fact that we're having this raging debate, whether it's 25 or 50, just speaks to how poor the communication process has been. Uh, but... I do believe there is a high probability of a 50. Uh, I also uh, push back on disappointment. Uh, not everyone uh, will be disappointed. Disappointment is not equally distributed. Uh, and I think a 25 would be far more disappointing to the market than a 50. So Greg, walk me through what would be disappointing about the Federal Reserve coming out today and saying it's 25 basis points. We think the economy is doing OK. If it gets worse, we're ready to act. What would be disappointing about that? Well, just expectations, right? And so what's being priced in the market, uh, ultimately the markets are a forward discounting mechanism. Uh, and really what the markets are looking for is where is neutral? How close are they going to get to neutral? How close are they going to get to being accommodative? And the idea behind a 25 suggests that there are no rush to get there. And the markets want to get there sooner rather than later uh, in order to kind of justify this soft landing thesis. Is there any scenario, Greg, where you could see Fed Chair Jay Powell outdoving this market already? <laughs> well, it's really hard to do, Lisa. I mean, the market just push and push and push. Uh, at every turn, there's so much being priced in. But the only way to do that is really, you know, come in uh, over and above 50, which I think is a extremely low probability event, of course. But also keep in mind that we have the dot plot uh, coming out in the SEP and trying to square that circle, so to speak, in 2025 is what investors are going to look at. So what we need to see is kind of what is the idea of um, kind of neutral rate next year? What does inflation look like? What's growth? Um, uh, and I think the expectations will be to see the median dot uh, move down not only in this year, of course, which matters a lot less, but more so in 2025 and 26. Greg, to that point, and Senator Warren will be disappointed with the disappointment that will go around because you just indicated probably a 75 basis point rate cut is not in the cards today. There is this question going forward, though, of just whether this market cannot be on the right side, given how much they've priced in without any sign of weakness and with what we saw earlier this morning, mortgage applications picking back up and actually mortgage rates falling already to the lowest in two years before the Fed does anything. No, I think that's quite right. The markets have pushed this in such a meaningful way. I know I mentioned markets are a forward discounting mechanism, but this is that in extremis. Uh, and so I do think uh, the markets will be poised for disappointment uh, at some point. I look at kind of the front end, belly of the curve, twos, you know, sevens, there's you know too much being priced in in forward space. Uh, all roads lead to kind of 280 in forward space. A lot has to happen uh, from now to then. Um, and honestly, you look at across markets, the bond market is essentially telling you that a recession is a high probability event, but you have risk markets still trading as if it's uh, a go-go type of economy. So I think that has to be reconciled here 
over the next you know six months or so, uh, because right now there is a huge disconnect. Greg, when it comes to what Lisa was just talking about, the fact that we already see in mortgage applications, some parts of the market, they're already pricing in basically the Fed cut. What is the risk now for a reacceleration of inflation as the Fed brings down uh, rates? Yeah, I think that's one of the uh, biggest risks that we face uh, heading into uh, 2025. Uh, it is the firm belief that inflation is no longer an issue. But if you start stimulating, right, if you move uh, into a, an accommodative uh, stage when the, the economy is actually still pretty decent, uh, then I think that risk uh, is on the rise. And I don't think investors are properly focused on that as a uh, potential tail risk here. How are you expressing that in terms of your positioning? Are you moving away from longer term bonds at a time where yesterday's auction, you know, a little problematic with a 20 year? Yeah, well, the 20 year is always problematic. Uh, but the the uh, the way we're thinking about it is more uh, more being realized in the front end. So um, I don't think the the trade and fixed income, at least in Treasury space, is in 10s, 30s or even 20s. Uh, I think it's uh, more kind of tens in. Uh, in. So once again, if you look at what's being priced uh, over the next, you know, two years, three years, and you can look at one year, one year, two year, one year, whatever your uh, uh, choice forward is, it's all pointing to the same place, the same direction of like 270 ish. Uh, and that seems overly aggressive to us. So I think the trade is more on the front end, leaning against those forwards than uh, anything else. Just help me with the long end just a little bit, Greg. I'm just working through some issues in my own head about how this is going to work. Let's say they disappoint and don't validate market expectations today. I just wonder how that works out at the longer end of the curve. Do you look at the 10 year after that and do you price out rate cuts or do you start to price in a policy error and a Fed that's not moving quick enough, and does the long end actually rally? This is where I'm struggling, the longer end of the curve. How do you think about it? That's an excellent question. I mean, the uh, the duration side of the fixed income market has a mind of its own lately, right? All roads lead to lower yields. So, uh, so I do uh, have some sympathy for that view. However, I do believe that if uh, you don't see rate cup cuts come through, uh, uh, at the pace that's being priced in, that has to manifest itself uh, into uh, at least ceasing the rally uh, in the back end and even maybe pushing rates higher. So, you know, rates seem uh, fully valued to us. Uh, and the way we're really thinking about it is in order for fixed income to realize where the forwards are to justify the current back end, you have to see rate cuts come come through the system and come through probably even faster than what's being in, priced in the front end. You know, I would think that actually if the Fed were to disappoint and only cut by 25 basis points, people would buy the back end aggressively and vice versa. If they cut by 50 basis points, it actually increases the chance of inflation picking up more at the other end. Greg, why is that not the trade? Well, that could be the trade, too. I, I mean, uh, you know, that is, um, you know, that is a plausible scenario. Right. Um, uh, and kind of the debate that we're having just highlights what a tricky uh, environment we're investing around and, and the tricky environment that the Fed is, con, you know, contending with. So um, it it's normally much more straightforward. It's less straightforward today. So so I have a lot of sympathy for your arguments. Um, uh, I just really think it's an open, uh, open road here. Agreed. Greg, thank you, sir. Appreciate the clarity or the lack thereof, the honesty. Greg Peters <laughs> of PGM. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Long end of the curve. I have this debate in my own mind. The investor committee in my own head sort of throwing things at each other and trying to work out how this works out today. The life of Pharaoh. It's sort of a very aggressive and uh, intense life. There is this point, though, which is uh, if you see a Fed that's more aggressive in terms of uh, cutting more aggressively, doesn't that lead to the inflation potentially creeping higher in inflation expectations over the long term? Or is that irrelevant at this point? I think the bias in this market right now is the Fed needs to cut because the labor market might be in trouble and they need to get ahead of it. I think it's the bias right now in fixed income for the people that we speak to on any given day. Mike writes in. Mike, thank you. How about the Fed just does 0 0.375 basis points and got, pleases everyone? I got a similar message. Yeah, split the baby. Yeah. I think that, you know, why not go out there, say, look, we hear everyone. We're not sure. So we're going to cut by 0 0.4%. To just to bias it a little bit more. I, I'm not level. sure that's how it works on a committee today, but then again, who knows? <laughs> they, they, could just, they could just track work, you know, on, on the Bloomberg terminal and see where the projection is and, and just track that. I've got some good news for you. It's almost over. We get the decision at 2 p.m. 
the news conference at 2.30, and then after that at 3.30, we can sort of like lick our wounds and work out what happened, right? <laughs> Which everything will Something be the like opposite that. of what we expected. There'll be disappointment, though. Up next, Dan Suzuki of Richard Bernstein, Yelena Shulicheva of BNP Paribas, Earl Davis of BMO, and David Rubenstein of the Carlyle Group from New York. This is Bloomberg. You have lower interest rates, which the Fed is going to deliver. The question is how much. We're looking for a 25 basis point rate cut, but for them to really signal they're going to do a sequence of cuts here. A lot of the people on the street that have 25 basis point rate cut calls, they'd have no problem with the Fed going 50 either. There's a really good chance that they move 50 simply to front load the process. They do need to be cautious of being too dovish because we're coming off some pretty significant speculation, but it's still not relieved from the market yet. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Perro, Lisa Abramowitz and Anne-Marie Hordern. Got a message just moments ago, just flip a coin. Is that what they're doing on the committee right now? Just flipping coins? I think basically everyone is as sick of this discussion right now, but we're going to have it. Is it 25 or 50? We want to know. Burning minds want to know. And we'll find out today at 2 p.m. We've said a million times it's a three-part act. You get a statement, some forecast, and then you get the news conference. It's the package that really matters, whether it's 25 or 50. What comes with it? That decision a little bit later on this afternoon. In anticipation, your equity market very close to all-time highs on the S&P 500. This morning up by 0.05% on the S&P. Lisa on the Nasdaq up by 0.1%. The question of just how this market can actually get further boosted by rate-cutting expectations after 240 basis points of rate cuts already have been baked into the market through the end of next year. Does Fed Chair Jay Powell outdove himself, outdove the markets at a time where the stakes are pretty high? Key question will be what the threshold of data will be that they look at. Are they still data dependent? And what data are they looking at to justify a move that a lot of economists are saying, eh, really? I mean, it's still looking okay. When it comes to the market expectation, Greg Peters, 25 more disappointing than 50. If they cut 25, what does Powell need to say? to shore up potentially those disappointed market participants. This one's in the weeds and it's for the bond investors, but the conversation we just had with Greg Peters of PGM was an important one about the long end of the curve. If the Fed does not validate market pricing today, comes out with 25 and doesn't commit about getting back to 3% anytime soon in a timely manner, and we get that disappointment, so-called disappointment, do we get a rally at the long end because we start to price in a policy error? Or do we get a sell-off because we're pricing out rate cuts after pricing them in so much over the last few months? What do we get? We have no clue. And I think when I was listening to his response, which was actually refreshingly honest, which is you can pre present a fantastic logical argument one way or another, it doesn't actually mean that the, uh, the economy and the market is going to respond that way, just shows you that right now this is a market where logic comes to die. We have no concept of exactly what the scenario analysis is for the market, for the Federal Reserve. We don't understand what the economic data is. And so this is the reason why you see a lot of chop with people just going against the sort of uh, status quo at any given time on the margins, because how else do you have conviction. Is that the new line from the bears, the market where logic comes to die? Is that the new line from the bears? <laughs> Am I the like embodiment of the bears? <laughs> I mean, I went out to Jackson Hole, I dressed up, Is felt right? like I was really, you know. I'm going to borrow that line. I think that's absolutely <laughs> brilliant. Equities right now on the S&P, just about positive. If you are just joining us, welcome to the program. Just a sneak peek at the price action in the bond market. On a 10-year, we look like this. Yields are higher by around about three basis points on a 10-year, 367.56. The euro a little stronger, dollar a little weaker. Euro dollar 111.26. Coming up this hour, we'll catch up with Dan Suzuki of Richard Bernstein advisors with stocks near record highs ahead of the Fed. Poonam Goyal of Bloomberg Intelligence's e-commerce boosts U.S. retail sales. And Yelena Shiracheva of BNP Paribas on why the FOMC will start small. We begin with our top story, the stock market rally on hold. Traders still split of the expected magnitude of today's anticipated rate cut. Dan Suzuki of Richard Bernstein advisors saying the question really isn't whether the Fed cuts 25 or 50, but whether you're actually going to get the nearly 200 basis points of cuts that are priced over the next six months. Dan joins us now for more. Dan, good morning to you, sir. Good morning, guys. To achieve the degree of rate cuts that are priced, do we need to slow down that this equity market is ultimately not going to like? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I mean, I think you have to see further 
uh, you know, declines in inflation beyond, I'd say, the 2% level and further declines in GDP and economic growth, you're just not seeing those signs. Even unemployment, where I do agree that the employment market has softened, you know, since the last FOMC meeting, jobless claims had spiked into that meeting. They've come back down. Economic surprises are up. Employment diffusion is up. So I, I don't, I'm not trying to say that everything's rainbows and, and unicorns, but I do think that uh, things aren't falling off, and they never do fall off as fast as the market expects them to. Let's say we don't get the 200 this price, but let's say we do get decent growth and this continues and jobless claims stay in this range of 230 to 250 for the time being. Can you stay with trades like small caps, with cyclicals like banks? Does that still work? I think that's a great time to be invested in those types of cyclicals because what you're picturing, what you're, you're painting a picture uh, of an environment and an economy where growth is pretty good, uh, profits are likely going to accelerate off of the, the profits recession we're coming out of, and the Fed's still cutting rates, just not cutting as aggressively as been priced. And I think that's a great combination of factors for those types of stocks. Do we need rainbows and unicorns at a time where everything seems to want to go up? I mean, essentially, I'm looking right now at mortgage applications and mortgage rates. John brought this up earlier, this idea that you actually see mortgage rates now. At the lowest levels in two years, the Fed has not cut yet, just a reminder. We also are seeing mortgage applications picking up quite considerably at a time when we're expecting something from the Federal Reserve. How likely is it that a reacceleration of the economy, albeit perhaps bad for the bond market, will actually be fantastic for stocks? So either way, it's going to be good. I think it depends on your time horizon, right? You're probably, you're pulling forward gains to feel those pains later is probably the scenario you're dealt with if you get that reacceleration in growth because, you know, it's going to feel great for a little bit, but then you're going to bring back those inflationary pressures when your starting point, you know, on inflation is north of 2% and you get growth acceleration, that means inflationary pressures are back on the table. And at some point, the market's going to go back to a world where good news is bad news. We're not there right now. We're taking a little vacation from the good news is bad news story. But we'll get back there once inflation comes back into the picture. What are you doing with this? I mean, I'm listening. My head is spinning. Uh -huh. I, you, you hear all the scenario analysis and you hear uh, you, all these logical scenarios that are lovely and that might absolutely fail. How do you position. I, I'm a big believer in KISS, you know, keep it simple, right? I think what you should do uh, is, is just understand that the market's gotten too, probably too aggressive in overpricing, you know, the trajectory of fe Fed cuts over the next six months. Uh, so you want to lighten up on that duration story a little bit. And at the same time, uh, I think, you know, this is a pretty supportive environment, at least for the next six months for these cheap cyclicals where their profits, ultimately it comes down to profits. If you're an equity investor, it comes to profits. What's going to drive the earnings acceleration from here? What's accelerating? What's improving? It's no longer the mega caps. That baton is being passed and it's being, it's broadening out. And so this is the opportunity. This is, you've seen this move start to happen in the market, but if you look at a five-year chart, it's, it's, it's a tiny little glitch. And so there's tons more room running. Are, are you saying that it's independent right now of what the Fed is, what the Fed does? That right now, even if the Fed cuts by 25 basis points, this rotation will continue? It depends on your time horizon, right? On a one week basis, probably not. Uh, but as you look out over the next six months, I think it, earnings, it comes down to fundamentals. Uh, and, and I think fundamentals are really about earnings and that earnings story is broadening out. So I think you can ignore the Fed. People overemphasize the, the importance of the Fed, uh, particularly at this point in the cycle. Whether or not it's the rotation or whether or not we actually get those 200 basis points of cuts that the market's pricing in, how much is the politics going to affect that? Because potentially the composition of Congress could change what kind of environment we'll have for inflation in 2025. Yeah, we literally put out a piece yesterday that said fade the election. And this has been a mantra of mine forever. I mean, even if you know with perfect foresight who's going to win the election and what their policies are going to be, I would contend with you, just look at the last four administrations, you do the opposite and you make a boatload of money. So I think that's, not, that's going to be the story this time. Uh, and I don't think you should really be investing based on politics. You should vote based on politics, but you shouldn't invest based on them. And so even if we get some sort of, you know, sweep and, and huge spending bill, you know, there's going to be a lot of time you know, and uncertainty between now and when that happens. Right. But 2025 is critical for the market. You think yeah. of things like tariffs that could be unilaterally changed by the White House. And then we have the sunset of the Trump era tax cuts. Yeah. We're talking about potentially a 28 percent corporate tax rate or a 15 percent corporate tax rate. Yeah. How do you fade that? 
I think you fade it because between now and then there's just going to be a whole lot of noise around it, right? So it's good. It's good. You're going to, especially in this market, which is I, I characterize as a shoot first, ask questions later market that w operates in three month narratives. You're going to have a, a narrative where, you know, we're getting massive tariffs in the next three months. And then you're going to have a, a narrative where we're going to recession where you don't have to worry about inflation. You know, so all these stories are probably going to play out and have their fits and starts. To try to trade that, it's, it's, it's out of my purview. For so where does the conviction come from that we get improving breadth and this continues? Where does that confidence come from? This has been a theme from you and the team for a while, yeah. that this would move away from mega cap tech and it would go elsewhere. What are the pillars that underpin I, that? I, I think the pillars right now are that it's happening. I mean, just look at growth numbers for the Magnificent Seven. Just look at growth numbers for the other sectors. You're actually starting to see that breadth. Why actually, isn't this just a three-month narrative, though? Just another one. Well, it, it very well could be if we get some sort of shock and then this, this acceleration and growth that you're seeing broadening out, it could roll over. But remember how easy the comparisons are coming off of this incredibly low base. You know, while the S&P level, you're six quarters or seven quarters into a profits acceleration, the rest of the S&P is basically, you know, their earnings have been declining. They're in a massive, de massively depressed earnings. To think that you're going to have another down leg from there in an environment where economic growth is pretty good, I think that's a bit of a stretch. What are you advocating for? Can you afford not to own names like NVIDIA, these big AI themes with real money coming off the other side? Well, I think, it, again, it really depends on your time horizon. As we've seen, uh, you, you know, these these environments can last for a long time where they're driven by momentum and sentiment until you see liquidity roll over or to, until you go into some sort of major slowdown, which again, I don't think is happening. There's no reason to expect that they're going to crash, right? So if you want to own some of them, I think that's reasonable, but I don't think you put all your eggs in that basket in a world where this is the most concentrated, most expensive market that you've seen in a long time. That is a market that, that begs for diversification in your portfolio. And you're not going to do that by going to buy more NVIDIA. Well, some people have just gone and bought more utilities. Yeah. Can we finish on utilities? It's a sector we keep coming back to on this program. It's up by more than 20% yeah, today. It's had a massive run. What is this trade? What is it to you? Well, I think you have to remember, you know, it's up by more than 20% because it got completely demolished you know, in the, in the prior six months. And I think a lot of that was, you know, some regulatory concerns around pricing and whatnot. I think when you step back from it, people have to realize that utilities and the rest of the defensive sectors are one of the best performing sectors of all time. You know, when you go back over a long period of time, they have some of the most competitive and best returns. So if you get a point where sentiment goes away from them, which they typically do during most of the bull market where they're lagging, that is where you want to build positions. And so if you start to worry about the economy here and growth, the more you should be thinking about adding utilities to your portfolio because there is also a rate play in there as well. Dan, it's good to see you. Appreciate the update. It's Thanks been too long. Guys. Come back soon. Dan Suzuki there of Richard Bernstein Advisors. Counting you down to that Federal Reserve decision with an update on news elsewhere with your Bloomberg brief. Here's Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. General Mills shares are lower by one and a third this morning in the pre-market, even though it did report earnings that beat and matched estimates. Their smaller than expected drop in sales were thanks to higher prices for certain snacks. It also reaffirmed its 2025 forecast, but noted an uncertain macro backdrop for customers. Gross margins also fell, driven by input cost inflation. JP Morgan is in talks with Apple about taking over its credit portfolio that rival Goldman Sachs no longer wants. The card was part of Goldman's effort to solidify its attempt at consumer banking, which it has since abandoned. JP Morgan is among a slew of card issuers looking into the Apple card. People familiar with the matter tell Bloomberg that Nippon Steel has been given more time to try and take over U.S. Steel. The Japanese company has been granted permission by a U.S. security panel to refile its purchase plans. The extension restarts the clock on the review and is likely to push the ultimate decision on the takeover past the U.S. elections in November. President Biden, Kamala Harris and Donald Trump all say they oppose the acquisition. That's your brief, John. Danny, thank you. More from Danny again in about 30 minutes. Up next on the program, The Morning Calls, plus Poonam Gore of Bloomberg Intelligence as online shopping boosts U.S. retail sales. That's next. This is Bloomberg.
So let's start here. Just where did this conversation about a 50 basis point reduction of the Federal Reserve actually come from? This is what happened. We've got a July payrolls report in early August, which was weaker than expected. And we started to talk about a growth scare. It was on top of jobless claims breaking out to 250 and beyond on top of the ISM manufacturing coming out with a pretty dreadful number as well. And the conversation quickly moved on. Given some of the price action as well, big shakeout in equities, and all of a sudden people started to talk about 50 basis point reductions at the Federal Reserve. Should we still be talking about 50 basis point reductions at the Federal Reserve, given the jobless claims are back to 230? So we did a big round trip in the market, get to the back end of August and had a speech in Jackson Hole from the chairman, the Fed chair. This is what he had to say in late August. We do not seek or welcome further calling in labor market conditions. Started to sound like, to some of you at least, 50 basis point rate cut might be on the cards for September 18th. So we waited for the jobs report. That would settle this whole debate. It didn't. Then we waited for a retail sales report. That would settle this whole debate. It didn't. So we're still here. Coin toss. Finally balanced between 25 and 50, we're told repeatedly. I think the big takeaway from me for the Fed speak over the last month is not that they told us they would cut by 50 basis points. It's that they didn't come out and say they wouldn't. And that didn't put this story to bed because here it still is alive and well going into this afternoon. He didn't use the word measured pace. He didn't talk about a methodical cutting cycle. He didn't talk about going slow. He didn't talk about all of the things that people were expecting him to say to signal that they were going to go 25 basis points. Key uh, aspect to me of this whole situation is the fact that a lot of behemoth investors and thinkers really disagree. The fact that you have Jeff Gunlock saying we're probably already in a recession and 50 absolutely should be the right call. You're hearing that from Neil Dutta as well, not the recession part, but the 50 basis points. Also from Bill Dudley, Ray Dalio saying the right thing is 25. Most economists saying the right thing is 25 because when you look at the economic yeah. data from retail sales to uh, home uh, mortgage applications, it doesn't look so bad. The 25 versus 50, I think we need to park. Tan Suzuki was just on from Richard Bernstein. He made the point that's not the important part of the story. It's the other 200 that's priced that is. Why do we have this confidence that it's a one-way trip back to 3% from here, regardless of whether it's 25 or 50? Where does that come from and how different is that to what we hear from other central banks, including the ECB? Let's go to the Fed's basement. Torsten Slock was talking about uh, Wait, John Williams shaking is. off. John Williams <laughs> is there with the R-Star. I want to talk about something else that's there, this long and variable lag tag that's sticking out of the corner of one of the old bicycles in the corner. It, there is a feeling that there are long and variable lags and that the five and a quarter to five and a half percent of rate hikes really still have to trickle into the economy and we'll see some of that pain come through early next year. There is that belief that it's out there and that it will be a long and variable lag for the other side for the rate cuts to really start to affect the economy in a material way. That's what I would really uh, chalk that up to. Market participants, investors, traders will tell you this is a very, very finely balanced decision. That decision at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Even more interesting given the fact we're near all time highs on the S&P 500. Equity futures just about positive on the S&P on the Nasdaq up by 0.06%. If you switch up the board with equities close to all time highs, we've got bond yields near the lows of the year. Just off them as yields start to push higher in yesterday session and we continue that trend this morning up two basis points on a two-year 362.34 up three on a 10-year to 367.93 that's the price action let's get you some morning calls first up William Blair initiating coverage on Nvidia with an outperform rating highlighting the company's leadership positioning within gaming and artificial intelligence your second call from Guggenheim upgrading Sirius XM holdings to buy pointing to strengthening subscriber trends and stabilizing free cash flow that stock is up by more than two percent and Finally, Barclays upgrading VF Corp to overweight, the analyst noting significant improvements under the retailer's new CEO. Their stock is up by a little more than 3%. Let's stick with the consumer. August retail sales getting a boost from e-commerce, signaling resilient household demand. But the report doing little to help settle the debate over the magnitude of today's expected rate cut. Joining us now is Poonam Goyal, Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Analyst for US Retailing. Poonam, I'm not going to ask you whether it's 25 or 50. I'm not going to torture you with that. I want your read on where retail is and where the US consumer is currently. The consumer is making choices and they're clearly making the choice to shop online is what we saw in the retail sales figure. I think, look, the consumer still wants value. They're looking for value. They are strapped, but they're willing to spend. They're traveling a little less with your big ticket expenses so they can afford to buy more things. And that's really what we've been seeing over the last few months. 
But um, I'm laughing because the idea that we're talking about retail sales and the only reason why people cared about retail sales was 25 or 50 basis points <laughs> is just hilarious to me. It's ultimately, it's talking about the strength of the consumer. We're talking about whether people actually have the ability to keep going out and buying. And we actually saw a decline in grocery store sales. And I'm just wondering, like, what was the actual takeaway other than 25 to 50 basis points? Is this an, a consumer that's accelerating? Is it one that's holding in there? Or were there signs of true weakness under the hood? I think it's definitely not a sign that the consumer is accelerating. We are hearing from everyone that we talked to, that the consumer is making choices. I, I'll go back to, you know, last year and the year before after the pandemic, you were spending thousands of dollars to travel because that is what you wanted to do. Now that you're not doing that so much, that money is in part going to savings because they're trying to build back those savings accounts, paying off debt, and then also spending a little, but making choices, right? What are you buying? Are you buying electronics? Not really. Are you buying clothing? Maybe a little for back to school here in the latest months, but really you're shopping for things that you need or you're shopping on impulse. And online is the best place to buy on impulse because it's influenced by social interactions on social media. Are impulse buys a sign of strength or a sign of weakness? The fact that that's where the strength has been, does it just signal sort of the American way of, I want that, or is this something where people have the ability to say, I want that? I think it's both. I think, you know, you want that, so you get it, but then later you realize, oh my gosh, did I overspend and do I need to pull back? I think we're going to see a lot of that over the next few months where people will gravitate towards buying on impulse, but then they'll realize that maybe I spent too much and maybe now, you know, I need to pull back a little. So they'll be making more steep choices and demand will be fickle and, you know, people will be making choices on and on. And we're heading into the holiday season, right? So um, we're going to see more sales that are going to entice people to spend earlier and earlier in the season. When it comes to choices, Andrew Hollenhorst of City, just publishing now, talking about declining restaurant spending, made them more concerned, the team over there, about the developing economic slowdown. When you look at choices, do you still see consumers moving to services over goods? I don't. I actually see them pulling back from services a little and moving more towards goods because they've enjoyed the services for the past two and a half years and they've probably over splurged in that area. So now they're going back to the basics, back to the roots. Where is their convenience? Where is it their stuff that they want to buy that maybe they haven't bought in the last few years because they've been enjoying themselves in experiences? But that said, you know, people will still go to the spa. They'll still travel, but it just won't be in an excessive manner like it has been in the last few years. Interesting. Thing. Punam, thank you. We've got to leave it there. Punam Gore there of Bloomberg Intelligence. We've got some data a little bit early this morning that I want to repeat and share with you. This came from MBA Mortgage Applications. The index rose 14.2% in the week ended September 13th after rising 1.4% in the previous week. Mike McKee sent over some more details on this. I think it's worth pouring over. Mortgage Applications rose for a fourth consecutive week. Purchases were up 5.4%. Refis increased 24.2% after rising 0.9% in the prior week. And we did this with a 30-year fixed mortgage rate of about 6.15%. So we're just down to the low 60s, and that's already what you're unlocking. That's a two-year low, and it comes at a time where it's enough of a dec decline, and we were talking about this earlier. Uh, the fact that people see this as a time to get in because guess what? Rates are only going lower than here. from here. This is really the key question. If you have conviction of the path of where rates are going, why not buy now and ask questions later? Because uh, as Alicia Levine was pointing out, you can always refinance later. Why not get in now? Home Depot has been a difficult trade on the equity side. Home improvement, we've seen that repeatedly across several names. That trade over this month just doing a little bit better, up by something like 4%. Decent quarter so far as well. Is the market already there? already there thinking about this theme as we unlock this housing market a bit more? That's the ultimate question because if it's already there. This is a market that gets ahead of whatever the Federal Reserve does. There is a key question here about how much you start to see a re-acceleration of inflation, a re-acceleration of growth that goes against it. It's sort of like the uh, Heisenberg theory, right? That you can't do an experiment on something without having an effect on it. And there is this issue, this sort of challenge that the Fed has to deal with right now with respect to communication and why it potentially could be a liability to be overly dovish. Welcome back to the show. It's good to see you. Okay, look, you know, it's just it saying, I, I just, <laughs> you have to understand that when you connect retail sales so directly, you know, this is what happened. 25 or 50, it just did me in. It's been quite a month, hasn't it? Got a few more hours to go, Grandma. It's her birthday. Happy birthday.
Fed decision special a little bit later on this afternoon. Starts at 1.30 Eastern time. This is what TK's got to do when he joins this program. He's got to sing How Deep Is Your Dove by Deutsche Bank. Zero Hedge just posted this. Have you seen this? Yes, The I title have. of Deutsche Bank's yeah. research, How Deep Is Your Dove. Would you like to start singing? I'm it? not doing that, but TK will at 1.35 Eastern time. Tune in. Don't miss it. Equity features on the S&P 500 look like this. We're just about positive on the S&P 500. After closing yesterday, just about in positive territory. A seven-day winning streak, very close to all-time highs going into this Federal Reserve decision. We're up a tenth of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq 100, up by 0.14. One hour away, just about from the cash open. Here's your morning movers. Here's Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. Just about an hour or so ago, we got earnings from General Mills. And even though they beat on most metrics, shares are down 2% in the pre-market trade. The rub was margins. Margins deteriorated because they're still suffering with cost input inflation. Volume sales were down some 2% in North America. It's that same story of American shoppers being more picky at the grocery store, especially for private labels. Elsewhere, Google, a rare win in the EU courts for them, especially considering just last week they had lost one of their battles. This was over a 2019 fine of one and a half billion euros that they illegally prevented their rivals from placing ads on third party websites. The EU's top court saying mistakes were made, so shares popping slightly higher on that news. Finally, rounding things off with the story you all have been talking about this morning, U.S. Steel up 3.8 percent. A securities panel in the U.S. giving Nippon Steel a chance to refile their intention to take over U.S. Steel. That basically resets the clock. It means we won't get a decision until after the election. There's no signs that Biden, let alone Trump or Harris, would change their opposition to the takeover. The union downplayed it, but, John, it keeps the dream alive. Danny, thank you. The dream alive just about until after the election. We'll see. Danny Berger there with some movers this morning. What have we started now? Thomas writes in, the first cut is the deepest. Rod Stewart. I didn't think of that one. You thought of that one? Yeah, that's the one I thought, especially Tom, given his age, would come on here singing. Oh, you think TK's going to sing Rod Stewart? Yeah. Okay, all right. (laughs) No, sing it all. You think that's more appropriate than the Bee Gees? Yeah, I think so. Okay, all right. Look out for that later. This is quite a promo, isn't it? <laughs> no, this is a the promo. promo. I guess it depends that. if it's 25 or 50, which song you get. Okay, so Tom's going to sing after the news conference. That's what he should do. All right. Looking ahead to all of this a little bit later, that and the actual decision, of course, and the news conference and the forecast. Mike McKee down in Washington to give you a little bit of a preview. Michael McKee, before we talk about 2 p.m., the decision, before we talk about 2.30, the news conference, and all the central bank decisions that follow, can you share with us what you saw in the mortgage application data this morning that tells you it's important? Well, what we didn't see is a continuation. This was a change, a big change in mortgage applications. And we have just had, in the last few minutes, housing starts come out up 9.6%. They fell almost 7% the month prior, and the expectation was for about a 6% rebound. So housing starts way up, and building permits way up 4.9%. All of this seems to suggest that maybe... If the Fed cuts interest rates, and we've already seen the markets price some of that in and mortgage markets pick that up, that you could unlock something here. Past two quarters, uh, residential uh, investment has been a drag on GDP. Maybe that turns around. Mike, there's this question uh, about whether the market's running away with itself in terms of yet another narrative. We started talking about the tick up in mortgage applications as well as housing starts. It can seem like a reacceleration, but From what? Can we put some perspective on this just to give a sense of how stagnant, how broken this market has actually been and how much of a gain this actually is? Well, real estate, as I mentioned, has been a drag in recent quarters on the GDP. And the real estate market has been all but frozen because people don't want to move. They don't want to trade in their lower mortgages for higher mortgages. Something like uh, 60 percent of people have mortgages below 5 percent. So the fact that mortgages are starting to come down, mortgage rates starting to come down, lures more people into the market, which should create more activity. Now, does that mean Prices go up because there's more demand, or does it mean supply uh, outpaces prices and uh, we see prices stabilize? Either way, it's good news for housing, and housing is a big part of the overall economy. Could be a big part of the conversation today on the FOMC as well. Mike, can you walk us through what I don't think many people understand? The inside inner workings of a Federal Reserve meeting across two days, the build-up to it, and the actual process, what things typically look like and how different this meeting might have been. 
Well, normally the committee members go into a meeting already having talked among themselves quite regularly. And Jay Powell touches base with all of them the week prior. So uh, he has a pretty good idea of where everyone is, which is why the news stories last week were so interesting that uh, the Fed seemed to be letting people know that you shouldn't discount the 50 basis point move possibility. On Tuesday, they come in and they get their presentations on the markets. They get their presentations on what's happening in the economy from staff, and they talk about any special issues that might be out there. We are on watch to see if they're going to do anything about the balance sheet and QT at this meeting. And then on uh, Wednesday morning, they come in and each one speaks. They present their views and then they vote. And uh, the question now is, does Jay Powell have something going here? Did he want a 50 basis point cut. Did he leak that to the newspapers so the markets would be prepared if that happens? And can he convince people to do it? So that's going to be, uh, it, this is one of the most interesting meetings in a very long time. I looked it up. It was September of 2016, uh, 2015 rather, the last time we did not know going into a meeting what the policy decision was going to be. Amazing. Remember it well. Mike McKee, thank you, sir. Appreciate it. With us around the table, Yelena Shuretseva of BNP Paribas. Yelena, good morning. Good morning. Now, I don't want to kick off with conspiracy theories, but I'm going to kick off with a conspiracy theory. <laughs> Mike touched on it. There was a feeling, a theory out there on Wall Street. We've all had these conversations that maybe this was a pressure campaign by the chairman himself to get the rest of the committee cornered, get market pricing towards 50 basis points, leave them no choice on the committee but to go with 50 basis points. Why is that the wrong way of looking at this discussion? Well, uh, I think there is something to that. And obviously, the lack of pushback from uh, the Fed throughout perceived backdoor channels suggests that probably that was the making of the chair. Because after all, at the Jackson Hole meeting, he was dovish. So uh, we were so spoiled. We have been so spoiled, right? Uh, just, OK, here is the data. Spoon fed. Yeah, totally. Uh, and here is uh, the decision that you are going to expect 10 days uh, before the decision itself, right? And we were getting into that, just feeling exactly uh, that. Uh, uh, Governor Waller's speech was pretty clear that we should be expecting a 25 basis point cut. Um, we did take some signal from uh, the uh, communication that followed, but uh, we still think that uh, 25 is probably the right thing to do. Um, we will not be surprised if it's a 50. If it's a 50, uh, we think that uh, the message from the chair will be that it's not a panic, it's still okay, we're just doing a catch up. So big picture, it doesn't really change it, right? So it's, it's still a good economy going into a soft landing. We've said repeatedly on this program, it's not just the cut 25 or 50, it's the full package. We get some forecasts. When you open up the summary of economic projections, that SCP right now is really stale. It's back in June, June's a lifetime ago. Lots changed since then based on a communication we've had. How different is that dot plot going to look? I think we're going to get uh, a significant move down in the dots, but I don't think the markets will get what uh, they are thinking for uh, 2025 end of year. So I think the Fed will probably go to 3.6 uh, with the median uh, next year. So I think... Uh, again, this is a part of the message. They are not panicking. We are not expecting a recession. We are still doing great. And uh, the economy, the economic data are telling us that uh, the economy is doing great. That message has been what's been supporting a lot of the equities that we're seeing in risk assets, including this expectation that the Fed will not allow this employment market to fall off a cliff. They have to revise up their unemployment rate for the end of the year if they want to just catch up to where it is currently. How much is that going to be an ongoing benign signal when they're going to have to increase the unemployment rate to some degree going out? It's an easy uh, one. I think uh, uh, Governor Wall already alluded to that in the uh, speech right before the uh, blackout period. It's a lot of it is supply driven and probably that's what it is. So they will uh, raise a forecast for the unemployment rate. We are at 4.4 percent by the end of the year uh, ourselves. But a lot of it is driven by uh, participation, by uh, the desire of people to join the labor market. And uh, that's not such a bad thing. How difficult is it going to be 
this debate of 25 or 50 at the next Fed meeting, depending on what they do today? The markets will complicate it. So if we get a 50, the markets will immediately want them to go further. And uh, that is a problem because this is what happened this time. So I think the tricky part for the chair will be to explain why it's not the case and it's still meeting by meeting decision. And I think he will do that in the case of a 50 basis point cut. Do long and variable lags still exist? I mean, is that still a theory? And the reason why I ask is because people believed in them with rates high saying, don't worry, the pain's going to come or worry, the pain is going to come. And now people are saying the Fed needs to cut now so that the actual implication for the market, the ramifications can come to the fore by early next year. Do you believe that or do you think that it's a much faster transmission mechanism given market expectations and given some of these other factors? I think it's still long. And uh, the reason is that uh, given the, le the level of uh, Fed funds rates right now, if you look at the mortgage market, uh, it's not as restrictive. Policy is not as restrictive as it should be. So, and that's probably one of the reasons that uh, the Fed should not rush uh, and uh, do the thing. But also, at the same time, you you really want to be ahead of the curve, and uh, you really want to to uh, act. Uh, to make sure that uh, you don't uh, end up in a hard landing scenario. That shift in the unemployment rate has made some people nervous. Clearly, the hiring rate has decelerated, declined somewhat over the last year. That's pretty evident. We can all see that in the economic data. What's behind it is more interesting. And I was reading your research. Do you think we're confusing the election calendar and maybe some election difficulties with cyclical weakness? Thank you for, for bringing it up, because I think there's a lot of uh, that uncertainty that we see in uh, ISM survey data, not just the data, but the survey itself, if you read it, if you read a lot of other things, you really sense that there's uh, uncertainty on the part of the companies. Why act now? Why hire more people now? Why uh, invest at this moment if uh, after a couple of months you will find out what uh, who the winner is, and you adjust your uh, expansion decisions based on uh, what we have at the time. If you're on the FOMC today and you bring this up, are you lonely or have you got company? Uh, because about the do you, think they, do you think they agree with you that some of this is the election? Uh, they wouldn't tell you, obviously, but I think that uh, they do read the same uh, stuff. They look at the surveys, they look at the beige book, and a lot of them are talking about uncertainty. So maybe we just wait it out. The economy allows you to, to wait it out and uh, make really crucial decisions next year. Research been a great read recently. It always is. It's good to catch up with you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Yolanda Shulateva there of BNP Paribas. Joining us now to continue the conversation, Earl Davis of BMO. Earl, welcome back to the program, sir. I want to finish this morning where we started this morning with this question. Are we overstating the importance of the first move from this Federal Reserve? In the grand scheme of things, no, because if it is a 25 basis points, um, they it will be a dovish 25. So the next one's going to be 50 without a doubt. So uh, I would say no. I, I would say it is being a bit overstated, but uh, uh, where it's not being overstated is, is we're going to increase the volatility no matter what happens today. Yeah, given that we're 50% of the market anticipates 50 and 50% 50 of the market anticipates 25, it means 50% of the market's going to be wrong. So uh, we will have enhanced volatility, but in the grand scheme of things, no, it doesn't make a difference. There's a question uh, around how some of the longer term expectations are going to get reset as well. And we've had person after person come on the show this morning saying that longer term, it seems like this bond market's being overly aggressive with how many cuts are being priced in. Are you sympathetic with that? Do you think that we're going to end up getting some sort of rejiggering of longer term expectations that could be potentially uh, more significant than the 25 or 50? Uh, yes, but this is where you have to break down bonds into um, nominal bonds and tips. Uh, we are better buyers of tips, uh, real rates. We think that's where all of the rally is going to happen in, not nominal rates. So this is the important thing about uh, being a bond manager and looking at the real rate. The reason why that is, is your real rate actually has a very high correlation with Fed policy. And that correlation increases once the central bank starts making their move either higher or lower. Um, and that's why we, we are overweight duration almost to our max long, and it's all in real rates.
This is a fascinating point, Earl. You're basically saying that you're, uh, you have strong belief that the Fed's going to cut aggressively, but you don't have a strong belief in what other uh, scenario there could be, i.e. fiscal, they could potentially push up yield premiums and longer term treasuries all in. Uh, yes, that's, that is correct, but it's not a market concern right now. We think that will be a 2025 story. Um, and, and that is why if we do get volatility and risk assets sell off or credit spreads widen, we will be better buyers of risk assets be, because we think lower policy rates combined with the fiscal stimulus will end up being a very good economy uh, in 2025. So we think that is supportive of risk assets. Uh, having said that, we do expect to see a repricing just given the volatility that we'll, we'll get for the balance of 2024. Important final point. Earl, thank you for the update, sir. As always, Earl Davis of BMO, one of the sharpest in fixed income. The two-year right now, the yield high by two basis points, 363 on a 10-year. We're up by three or four basis points going into this Fed decision at 368. With an update on stories elsewhere this morning with your Bloomberg Brief, here's Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. Vice President Kamala Harris is proposing a cap on the cost of child care. In an interview with the National Association of Black Journalists, Harris said no working family should pay more than 7% of their income for child care. It's the first time Harris has publicly spoken about the initiative in her campaign. The 7% cap was first proposed by President Biden in the 2021 Build Back Better package. Donald Trump says he will revive a state and local tax deduction that he capped during his first term if he's reelected. Capping the so-called SALT deduction had a disproportionate impact on regions with higher taxes and property values. Those are typically dominated by Democrats. The announcement came ahead of his rally in New York today, where Kamala Harris is leading the polls. BlackRock and Microsoft are teaming up in one of the largest efforts to build up AI infrastructure to date. The companies will seek $30 billion of private equity capital to build warehouses and energy sources. The projects will primarily be U.S.-based. A portion of the funds, though, will be deployed in U.S. partner countries. That's your Bloomberg Brief. John. Danny, thank you. Thanks for this morning. Up next on the program, we'll set you up for the day ahead, and we'll catch up with David Rubenstein of the Carlyle Group. That conversation, just around the corner. The opening bout, 41 minutes away. On a seven-day winning streak on the S&P 500, equity futures positive by 0.1%. Your day ahead. The rest of the week ahead looks like this. The Fed decision coming at 2 p.m. Eastern time, followed by a Chairman Powell news conference at 2.30 tomorrow. Another round of jobless claims, plus a rate decision from the Bank of England. Then it's the Bank of Japan's turn to close out Friday. Also coming up later on today, the premiere of the 10th season of the David Rubenstein Show peer-to-peer -peer conversations. You can watch David's interview with John Collison of Stripe tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern time on Bloomberg TV. David Rubenstein joined us now for more. David, first of all, congratulations on a 10th season. I know how much work goes into this show behind the scenes, so once again, congratulations for that, sir. I want to start with this conversation we'll see a little bit later on this evening, though, on Bloomberg TV. What did you learn about Stripe? What stood out for you? For those who aren't familiar with Stripe, it's a startup that was started up about more than 10 years ago now by two young brothers. Uh, one dropped out of Harvard, one dropped out of MIT. They came together and started a company which facilitates payments uh, over by Internet companies. So in other words, if you want to buy something from a young Internet company, uh, you could uh, process that payment through Stripe. It then expanded to more mature companies and now has a market value, private market value, somewhere between 65 and $70 billion. At one point, it had an internal market value uh, in the private markets of about $100 billion. So while it's not quite worth $100 billion today, it's worth a lot of money and maybe the most valuable privately held company in the United States. People are definitely curious about Stripe, but many other people would just say today it's Fed Day. Everyone's asking, is it 25 or 50? And I want to connect these ideas. In all seriousness, uh, how much does the innovation of a company like this, does the upstarts that drop out of brand name colleges to go do uh, interesting things really depend on where benchmark rates are? Well, a company like this really requires an uh, enormous amount of uh, a, a good environment for these kind of startup companies. And these two young brothers who are from Ireland, 
uh, came to the United States and they all started the company here. They didn't start in Ireland. Ireland's a wonderful company, a country, but, but clearly this is a place where you can start these kind of companies and I think have them thr- thrive and, and, and really uh, become significant companies. At some point, the company will probably go public. They haven't really needed cash because it's so cash positive, but at some point, I suspect they'll go public. I don't know exactly when, but, but it's going to be one of the most anticipated IPOs uh, the last decade or so uh, when, when this company does go public. There was one belief, uh, and this was maybe five, six years ago, that uh, companies were remaining private a lot longer, in part because of the interest rate environment and this shift into private credit, where you saw a lot of availability there. How much do you expect that to sort of uh, continue and that sort of be the new norm with companies waiting longer and longer to go public? Because that is what we had been seeing. Well, ever since Facebook was able to postpone going public for, for several years beyond what it would normally have done, people have recognized there's enough private capital out there to keep a company going in a private setting, even though it normally would have gone public. So there's plenty of capital out there. I think at some point, uh, the founders of, of, of uh, Stripe, I can't speak for them, the two brothers, but I suspect that they will go public at some point within five years or so. That'd be my guess, though they don't really need the cash, but there are advantages to being public. There are some disadvantages, but I think for their, their point of view, probably at some point going public would probably make sense. David, you're also the co-founder of Carlisle. Before we let you go, the big question of the day, 25 or 50, I know you've been answering this question before 50. Do you care? Is it something that you're actually watching? Well, everybody in the world is watching what happens uh, the market today. I suspect, I don't know for certain, but I suspect that 50 basis points is what the market is assuming. So something less than 50 basis points would probably be a bit of a disappointment and probably the markets may go down. 50 basis points is probably uh, what the markets around the world are probably expecting today, given where the economy is and the, the statements the Fed has made. But we'll see in, at 2.30. Thanks for the promo, David. Appreciate it. 2 p.m. for the decision, 2.30 for the news conference a little bit later on. David Rubenstein of the Carlyle Group. You can watch the premiere of the 10th season of David's show, Peer to Peer Conversations, tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern time on Bloomberg Television. Were you trying to find out if John Collison was 25 or 50? We just to think find that out? This is what we're doing today. We're connecting everything to 25 or 50. It's a ridiculous conversation, isn't it? It is. Particularly when we know it's about the whole package that comes a little we bit do. later. It goes way beyond just 25 or 50. And yet this is what the debate is. I mean, let's be honest. That's what we get note after note. We're the 25, we're in the 50. It's almost like, you know, a sports uh, affiliation. One person writing in, it's like the Super Bowl. You should have Beyonce do the warm-up act. <laughs> 150, let's see. No, we have David Rubenstein doing the warm-up act. Definitely doesn't want to talk about sports today, given what happened with his Orioles last night. But David Rubenstein said it does matter to markets around the world. Very different than Jamie Dimon, who said it's just a bunch of people on TV yapping about it, and it's not going to be earth-shattering. But what happens this afternoon is important for the markets, also important for the election cycle. This is going to be politicized on both sides. This is the easy decision. The harder one could be November 7th, and we have to keep that in mind throughout this afternoon. I wonder how much they're going to try to get ahead of that, and that's part of the reason for them uh, cutting 50 basis points. Yelena Shulyetyeva's point that you highlighted, Good I one, thought, right? was really interesting. How much are, is some of the data that we're getting muddied by the fact that companies, and frankly consumers, but companies more so, uh, don't have the same conviction to hire or make big moves ahead of an election that could potentially shift policy quite a bit? This is the kind of level of uncertainty that we have, not only with the economic cycle, but the data itself and exactly what it's reflecting. For companies, it's, are you seeing maybe a 15% tax, corporate tax rate, 28%? Are you going to have higher tariffs put up around the world when it comes to import, import costs? And when it comes to consumers, if you live in maybe a blue state and you're dealing with a salt cap of $10,000, maybe now the Republicans are you turning on that entire idea that they've been touting that it was a legislative win for them. You just don't know. So why make big calls? The outlook for 2025 could look very different by the time we get to November. Coming up at 1.30 Eastern, a Federal Reserve decision special, a Bloomberg surveillance special, the Fed decides. We'll be joined by Mohammed al Erin of Queen's College, Cambridge, Diane Swank of KPMG, Matt Lazzetti of Deutsche Bank and former New York Fed President Bill Dudley together with many others. Big names on Wall Street coming up a little bit later and tomorrow morning to follow on from that conversation we'll catch up with Peter Chu of Academy Securities, former Fed President Esther George, Republican Senator Tom Tillis of North Carolina with Anne-Marie and Sabatra Schappa of Sokchen. From New York City this morning, good morning to you all. That does it for us this morning. We'll see you this afternoon for the big one. 25 or 50 with an equity market close to all-time highs on the S&P 500 and bond yields very close to the lows of 2024. From New York, this was Bloomberg Surveillance.